As the sun rose on the 1st of November 1943, the Australian and Imperial Japanese armies were still locked in a fierce and deadly battle on the eastern Huon Peninsula. The Battle of Finchhafen had been one of the most dramatic moments of the Pacific War. Tasked with clearing the coast of the Huon Peninsula, the key position in securing the strategically vital Vitiaz Strait, one brigade of the 9th Australian Division, the 20th, landed on Scarlet Beach, some 10 kilometres north of Finchhafen. Allied intelligence had concluded that the Japanese garrison at Finchhafen was small. MacArthur's staff at GHQ concluded that around 300 men were in the area. In reality, Finchhafen and its approaches were strongly held by the entire 80th Regimental Battle Group, a force exceeding 5,000 in strength. Despite lacking a force ratio advantage and facing a heavily entrenched enemy, the gallant 20th Brigade had outfought the Japanese. By the employment of a series of outflanking manoeuvres, the 2nd 15th and 2nd 13th Battalions had reduced the formidable Japanese defences in the Salankawa Plantation and on the Kakakog Ridge, securing the town of Finchhafen and its vital port facilities. Holding this position was a prerequisite for any advance into the Bismarck Sea, and thus towards the Philippines. Rather than abandoning the coast of the Huon Peninsula as MacArthur expected, General Adachi, the 18th Japanese Army commander, ordered the main body of the 20th Japanese Division to drive the Australians back into the sea. With only a single brigade at Finchhafen, the Allied position was becoming increasingly precarious, as a Japanese force consisting of three regiments in total was bearing down on them. As the Australian generals begged MacArthur and GHQ for the transport required to move the rest of the 9th Australian Division forward, a movement that had been agreed upon prior to the attack on Finchhafen, the Americans refused, maintaining their belief that said reinforcement was both unnecessary and unwise, as diverting the precious amphibious assets to support operations around Finchhafen would only slow down the other offensives MacArthur was planning. After weeks of pleading, enough shipping was allocated to allow the movement of a couple of precious battalions forward. By October the 16th, three weeks after the initial landings on Scarlet Beach, the majority of the 24th Infantry Brigade had joined the beleaguered 20th. This reinforcement was executed just in the nick of time, as General Katagiri was about to unleash a ferocious attack on the Australian beachhead. Spearheaded by the fresh 79th Infantry Regiment, with the support of the 80th Regiment and an ensemble of other units, Katagiri executed perhaps the most dangerous Japanese offensive seen anywhere in the Pacific throughout 1943. Exploiting a gap in the thin defensive line, an area held by the 2nd 3rd Pioneer Battalion, the 79th Regiment was able to infiltrate the widely dispersed Australian hilltop positions, allowing for the majority of the formation to mass just inland of Scarlet Beach. In the ferocity of the attack, Brigadier Evans, the CO of the 24th Brigade, decided to shorten his line. With the objective of firmly securing the critical Scarlet Beach area, the logistical heart of the Australian position, the Brigadier abandoned the village of Katika, the critical junction between the 20th and 24th Brigades. After a Japanese force had reached the sea at Siki Cove, General Katagiri had succeeded in splitting the 9th Division in half. It was a truly precarious position. Indeed, it was the most dangerous moment a large Australian formation had faced since Singapore. The Japanese had not only divided the 9th Division, it had gained access to the rear of the Australian position, threatening Major General Wooten's artillery and logistics. It was a truly desperate moment, and had an inferior formation been deployed to Finchhafen, the attack of the 79th Regiment would have surely been a great and famous Japanese victory. In the end, it was a spot of good generalship and, more importantly, the valour of a couple of Australian battalions that saved the Allies from catastrophe. Immediately seeing the danger, Wooten deployed his meagre reserves. The exhausted 2nd 13th Battalion, which had suffered dearly taking the heavily fortified Finchhafen, was all that the Australian general had available. Wooten rapidly redeployed two companies of the 2nd 13th to take up blocking positions across the Siki Creek, and when Katagiri resumed the advance south to conduct what he thought would be mopping up operations, the Japanese were stopped cold by the heroic resistance and firepower of the 2nd 13th Battalion. Along the Saddleburg Road, the 2nd 17th Battalion faced the whole 80th Japanese Regiment. Holding an excellent high ground position at Javevenang, the 2nd 17th proved to be an immovable object, facing down wave after wave of ferocious Japanese assaults 
with the same cool rifle and automatic fire and steely determination as ever. Rather than driving the Australians from Jevevenang and trapping the 24th Brigade at Scarlet Beach in a daring pincer movement, the Japanese were simply adding to the mounds of dead soldiers that were piling up before the Australian Vickers gun positions. Confounded by this resolute resistance, the Japanese turned to infiltration, establishing a pocket astride the Saddleberg Road behind Jevevenang. Although this caused some inconvenience to the Australians, they were able to supply the 2nd 17th Battalion via Easy Street. Although all of the units that were deployed played an important part in the battle, in essence, the ferocious attack of the 20th Division had been stopped by just a few battalions. The 2nd 17th at Jub Ebenang, the 2nd 28th at Katika, and the critical cameo of the 2nd 13th had, largely alone, stopped the Japanese offensive in its tracks. The Japanese attack had been pursued with a suicidal valour that the Australians had now come to expect. Japanese infantry assaults were pressed hard in the face of well-sighted and defended Australian machine guns. The result was frightful Japanese casualties. More than 2,000 fell dead in a few days' combat. With the culmination of the Japanese October offensive, the Battle of Finchhafen itself had been won, but the job of Wooten's men was far from over. The Australian 2nd Corps had been ordered to clear the Huon Peninsula, and as part of that wider offensive, the 9th Division was to take not only Finchhafen, but Seo, securing the coast of the strategically vital Vitiaz Strait in the process. The majority of the 18th Japanese Army stood in their way. Although battered, General Katagiri's force was still essentially a full division. He had three regimental equivalents in and around Saddleberg and Finchhafen, and the remnant of the 51st Division was holding Seo. These units were, undeniably, badly depleted. They were largely without heavy weapons, such as artillery, were suffering from heavy casualties, and lines of communication back to Wewak, Madang, and Rabor were tenuous. Nonetheless, the indomitable Japanese fighting spirit remained. Japanese morale was remarkably resilient. Indeed, it was practically inexhaustible. No matter how desperate their situation, how clearly they had been beaten, Japanese soldiers would, almost to a man, stand and fight, often to the death. Thus, there would certainly be a very tough fight to drive the remaining Japanese from their formidable mountain defences around Saddleberg, and any further victory would certainly extract a heavy toll in Australian sacrifice. Despite its defeat around Jevevenang, the 80th Regiment specifically was still fighting hard, and now it would have to be driven from this formidable terrain. But by the end of October, it was clear that the Australians were finally in a position to go over to the offensive around Saddleberg. Only stragglers now remained in the area that had been held by the 9th Division prior to the Japanese offensive, with the exception of a single company of the 80th Regiment that was resolutely holding its position to the rear of Jivevenang along the Saddleberg Road. Thus, with the crisis past, it was now possible for the Australian generals to once again make plans for an offensive. Major General Wooten, the 9th Division CO, had been ordered by his corps commander, Herring, to take Finchhafen, develop it as a base and gain control of the coast to CO. Much had happened since then, but it now seemed opportune for the new corps commander, General Moreshead, to restate this objective. On the 29th of October, General Wooten was once again ordered to clear the Finchhafen area and drive on to CO. Unlike the initial offensive, which was conducted by a mere brigade group, the Valiant 20th, which, alone and outnumbered, had achieved so much, there were now more realistic forces available. The whole 9th Division was now present in the Finchhafen area, as opposed to the two brigades that faced down the Japanese offensive. These were supported by a squadron of Matilda tanks from the 1st Tank Battalion. Although the Australian units were in far better shape, Japanese and Australian forces were in roughly equal strength in the area, at least on paper. Opposing Wooten's three brigades, Katagiri deployed two regiments of the 20th Division and a regimental equivalent composed of a hodgepodge of other formations. But there were additional Allied units headed to the front. With the belated support of MacArthur, the Australians had been allocated enough shipping to move additional forces to the Finchhafen area. By the 20th of October, more artillery and engineers were en route, with two batteries of the 2nd 6th Field Regiment and a company of the 2nd 7th Pioneers on the water. These were joined by a force of commandos. In line with the changing role of the commandos, Australia's first special forces, the independent companies were transformed into commando squadrons, which now replaced the cavalry squadrons which had been an element of the infantry division's order of battle at the beginning of the war, 
These would provide Australian divisions with a dedicated special forces element, which would specialize in long range patrol, ambush, reconnaissance and direct action, one that was now optimized for jungle warfare operations. Although they had been initially designed to act independently, the commandos were now showing their worth in more conventional jungle operations. The 2nd 4th Commando Squadron would also move to reinforce Wooten. But by far the most significant deployment was the 4th Brigade. A militia formation, akin to the US National Guard, this additional brigade would be vital in holding the newly won base areas, allowing the 9th Division, an elite, all-volunteer AIF unit, to concentrate all of its forces for the offensive. On the 28th of October, this formation, less one company, was ordered to depart Ley for Finchhafen, where it would join the 22nd Battalion. Finally, the Australians were operating with forces that were adequate to the task which was being demanded of them. Wooten's back would be protected by the 4th Brigade, making the whole division available for offensive operations, and his men were now supported by commandos, armour, and ample artillery. But any advance along the coast towards Seo would be threatened by the thorn in his side, Sattelberg. Sitting like a mountain fortress overlooking the whole Finchhafen area, from this dominating position the Japanese would remain a constant menace to critical locations, such as the 9th Division Forward Logistical Hub at Scarlet Beach. The town of Saddleburg had been almost perfectly sculpted by nature to act as a fortress. At the very top of Saddleburg height, or at least on a false summit, the town itself sat on a flat plateau that was perhaps a few hundred metres wide. From here, the Japanese could literally look down on the Allied ships and personnel moving material at Scarlet Beach. On each side, the terrain fell away sharply. On every approach, the steepness was nearly 45 degrees, and each slope was covered in thick jungle. There was one road leading into the town itself, but this was very defensible. It even passed through a set of cliffs at one point, making flanking movements nearly impossible. Saddleburg, or at least the immediate Saddleburg area, was also something of a local line of communication nexus. Numerous tracks emanate out from Saddleburg. In addition to the main Saddleburg road, which wound down the mountains past Jivevenang to Heldsbach on the coast, there were several other tracks that ran to Katika and Wareo. These provided the Japanese with numerous different axes through which they could attack the Allied positions along the coast. Finally, Saddleburg also acted as a major track junction for routes that accessed the interior of the Huon Peninsula. If Wooten simply advanced along the coast to his ultimate objective, the primary Japanese logistical base in the area, Seo, this ominous and dominating Japanese position would constantly threaten his rear. This would not only mean that large forces would have to be left in the area to cover this position, probably something in brigade strength, but Generals Adachi and Katagiri had clearly shown that they had not given up hopes of driving the Allies back to Ley and recapturing Finchhafen. The 18th Japanese Army was clearly still capable of mounting very serious counter-offensives, and if one were launched at an opportune time, say when Wooten's forces were strung out along the coast in an attempt to capture Seo, the Australians may well face a repeat of the near disaster that had befallen them already during the Finchhafen campaign. Therefore, the 80th Regiment had to be driven from the mountains before any advance along the coastal road could be contemplated, but this was an ominous task indeed. Australian and Japanese units had been fighting along the Saddleburg Road for weeks, and it was clear that here, terrain favoured defence. Astride the road which ran steeply into the mountains from Scarlet Beach, a single company of the 80th Regiment was stubbornly holding its position to the rear of the 2nd 17th Battalion. In typical style, the Japanese had skillfully entrenched, in placing their crew served weapons expertly. The position sat on a ridge, covered by a coconut grove, which overlooked the track allowing the Japanese gunners to dominate both the main approaches to their position and prevent any movement towards Saddleburg. For days, the 9th Division had been trying to break through to Jovevenang, but thus far had made little progress. As Jovevenang was the only staging area for an attack on Saddleburg, this stubborn pocket of resistance had to be reduced before Wooten could realistically organise an offensive. As this was his area of tactical responsibility, Brigadier Windeyer's 20th Brigade was ordered to clear this formidable Japanese position. The valiant 20th, whose exhausted men had been in constant combat in the Finchhafen area for nearly two months, were once again selected for the task. Windeyer ordered elements from two of his battalions to begin squeezing the pocket from both sides. The 2nd 13th, which had suffered so dearly taking Finchhafen, was ordered to attack up the track, 
whilst the 2nd 17th would pressure the Japanese from Jaivevanang, aiming to move through the jungle and cut their communications to Saddleberg and Wareo. Leading the seaward attack was Captain Deschamps' company of the 2nd 13th. The twin battles of the Salankawa Plantation and Kakakol Bridge had been costly victories for Deschamps. He only had 35 men with him at the Coconut Grove. Clearly an inadequate force for the task at hand, the battalion CO, Colonel Colvin, reinforced Deschamps with two platoons from the battalion reserve. On the morning of the 29th of October, the attack began. As opposed to the typical battalion attack, with the infantry advancing under the cover of an artillery bombardment behind their bayonets, the 2nd 13th switched to infiltration. The men moved out in small, section-sized formations, each based around a single Bren gun. The 10-man units moved quietly through the jungle, leapfrogging each other on either side of the track. As they attacked, the men bounded, with one section covering the other as it advanced in short, careful movements. Eventually, Lieutenant Simmons' men reached a set of trip wires strung across the road, but even with this clear sign of Japanese presence, no resistance was encountered. Lieutenant Birmingham decided that the exact enemy positions had to be located. Leading his small patrol, Birmingham ventured out into the dark jungle. Quietly skirting to the right of the road, he eventually came upon a fallen log overlooking a clearing. From this position, right on the edge of the jungle, he watched the Japanese in their foxholes as they chatted to one another and cleaned their weapons, completely unaware of Birmingham's presence. After observing the situation for some time, Birmingham ordered his men to open fire. They hit the unsuspecting defenders with a flurry of grenades and a Bren gun magazine before retreating back to Deschamps' position. With the edge of the Japanese defenses now located, the captain ordered Simmons' platoon to advance and make contact. He moved his men to the log position without resistance. The Japanese were less than 15 metres away, but they did not detect the approaching enemy. Such was the nature of the country. This movement was accompanied by a left hook executed by Lieutenant Suter's platoon. As they approached from the left flank, they encountered a set of Japanese defences, a number of fighting positions supporting a machine gun. In a short and violent firefight, the Australians cleared this position. The brave Japanese gunners stood and fought, but eventually died at their weapon. Just before sunset, the Japanese launched their ubiquitous counterattack. A force of platoon strength came creeping down the track towards them. Luckily, the men now had use of the excellent Japanese fighting positions, and this attack was driven off. At dusk, the track had been cleared, but as night fell, the enemy could be heard digging in between the two Australian platoons, despite the fact that they were perhaps only 50 metres apart. Two Japanese soldiers who had been constructing these new defences became lost and walked into the company's position. One was shot as he approached, but the other had actually wandered between the foxholes. Once he was discovered, he could not be engaged for fear of hitting friendly positions to his rear. The Japanese man spent the night alone, cowering in a small depression surrounded by the enemy. Only the darkness kept him alive. He was so close that he would have surely heard the enemy speak to one another. The Australian official history ominously describes his fate in a single sentence. He was shot in the morning. By the 31st, the 2nd 13th and 2nd 17th were approaching one another. For two days on both sides of the pocket, the Australians had continued to squeeze, advancing carefully and slowly pushing the Japanese outpost line back. A patrol of the 2nd 17th had cut the main line of communication and the defenders' ammunition had to be running low, but still they would not retreat. The newly constructed Japanese fortifications were cleared by Sergeant Hall's 19 men. This meager force attacked four fighting positions that day each one a vicious, violent little battle fought with determined Japanese defenders. So often their enemy in 1942, in this close-range combat, the jungle was becoming the Australians' closest ally. It enabled Hall to approach these Japanese positions with concealment, allowing for a series of surprise attacks to be launched at close range. Despite the fact that progress was clearly being made by the 2nd 13th Battalion, it was decided that more concerted action was required. In the morning, with the 2nd 13th holding its positions close to the enemy, the 2nd 17th would attack from Javevanang. Despite its vital importance, the heroic defence of Javevanang had taken a heavy toll on the battalion. Although the men were suffering more from sickness, deprivation and the conditions as opposed to battle. The battalion diarist, writing in late October, described their situation. The battalion at present is rather uncomfortable owing to the almost incessant rain over the past 48 hours. This afternoon, mist obscured the whole area and seriously hampered vision. 
Everyone presents rather sorry spectacle as we are now reduced to one set of clothing. A relief will be welcome when it comes. The main Saddleberg Road has been cut now for 13 days, but it is hoped that this situation will be rectified in the very near future. Despite the awful conditions within the perimeter and the desperate need for relief, the men of the 2nd 17th left their foxhold and advanced towards the enemy. At 11.30am, the companies of the 2nd 13th all sat deep within their fighting positions as a hailstorm of 303 fire flew over their heads. The bamboo was so thick that the Australians could only advance in single file. They made it about 20 yards before the front two men were cut down. Realising that attacking under those circumstances was simply going to get his men killed, Major McClan called off the attack. They tried again next morning, but this time McClan's men would move off under the cover of a grand diversion. The 2nd 13th would fire all of their weapons for 15 minutes. But the two battalions were so close that the danger of a massive friendly fire incident was acute, and the 2nd 13th were ordered to fire deliberately high and to the right. Despite these precautions, Deschamps' men were engulfed in a storm of friendly fire when a single Vickers gun of the 2nd 17th poured 6,000 rounds into the Japanese defences. This deluge not only covered the infantry as it crept forward, but the fire was so dense that it effectively cleared much of the bamboo which concealed the Japanese position. The two battalions were now so close that they were almost in contact. In fact, given their proximity, it was decided that grenades could not be used. The loss of this weapon, a key tool in jungle warfare, was keenly felt by the men, but the danger to their comrades was simply too much. By afternoon, the 2nd 13th could see the 2nd 17th advancing towards them. They were only separated by a 100 yards or so, but the Japanese remained firmly wedged between them, stubbornly holding their positions in a tangled mass of bamboo. The Japanese were in a dire position. The company was wedged between two Australian formations, each of equal strength to their own. In all, including the 2nd 15th holding the position at Kumawa, there were three enemy battalions around this lone Japanese company. Their position was now so hard pressed that it had been squeezed into a tiny area, all of which was subjected to constant fire. Yet, despite their dire circumstance, they persisted. In fact, any careless movement by either of the Australian battalions immediately drew intense fire. For three days of constant battle, they had stood and fought, showing a fighting spirit and stubbornness in defence that the Allies had become all too accustomed to. Nonetheless, the relentless pressure of the past two days eventually achieved its desired effect. Morning of the 3rd of November found the Japanese positions empty. As the Australians made their final attack, they were greeted by a lone Japanese soldier sitting on the side of a trench. The dejected man put up no resistance. He simply waved to the infantry as they approached, first to the 2nd 17th and then to the 2nd 13th. Both battalions could clearly see him as they moved in. That's how close they had been to one another. Finally, after two weeks of constant battle with this valiant Japanese company, the road to Saddleberg had been cleared. With this small but vital Japanese position cleared, Wooten could finally begin moving on Saddleberg. His first priority was the relief of the 20th Brigade. Winday's men had largely won the Battle of Finchhafen alone, taking the town and the harbour in the face of determined Japanese formations holding formidable fixed defences. Indeed, Winday's brigade had never been operating at a force ratio advantage and lacked armour and heavy air support, yet it prevailed. Furthermore, without the heroic defence of Jaibebenang by the 2nd 17th Battalion and the steady pressure applied at Kumawa by the 2nd 15th, Katagiri's fearsome counter-offensive may well have succeeded. The feats of the 20th Brigade at Finchhafen place it amongst the best possessed by the Australian Army. But... This constant battle in hellish jungle had badly depleted the formation. It was in desperate need of relief. As their comrades fought for their lives, Brigadier Whitehead's veteran 26th Brigade had spent the Battle of Finchhafen sitting around the newly won base at Ley, smoking cigarettes and playing cards, stranded by a lack of transportation. Their arrival on the battlefield in late October, finally bringing Wooten's division up to full strength, marked the end of the Battle of Finchhafen. The Battle of Saddleberg would be largely up to them. With the clearing of the Saddleberg Road, these fresh battalions were finally able to relieve the 2nd 17th. On the right flank, around Scarlet Beach, the 24th Brigade began moving to the offensive. 
Here, during Katagiri's counteroffensive, the battle had been hottest and the Australians had come closest to disaster. The ferocity of the 79th Regiment's attack had nearly pushed the brigade back into the sea, taking Katika and cutting the 9th Division in two. But through equally stubborn and heroic defence, these battalions, especially the 2nd 28th and 2nd 43rd, had not only fought the Japanese to a standstill, but slaughtered them. Macabre evidence of their victory was strewn around the various battalion's fighting positions, with literally hundreds of Japanese bodies marking the brigade's gun line. Rather than an all-out offensive, the Australians relied upon their typical infantry doctrine of aggressive patrolling. On the 30th of October, three patrols left Katika and crossed the Song River. These encountered scattered Japanese elements, the largest of which was in platoon strength, but no large or heavily entrenched forces. In the far north of the line, the 2nd 43rd Battalion established an observation post overlooking the track between Bonga and Waraio. Here they were not only able to dominate the track with fire, if they so desired, but more importantly had a very clear view of movement along this critical line of communication, which the Japanese were using to supply Saddleberg. Within hours, a steady stream of reports were flowing back to Brigade HQ, detailing Japanese movements. Lieutenant Harvey reported, Reached OP 1500 hours NMS. Last 200 yards, crawled through Kunai. At 1650 hours, two Japs moved down the track, with rifles slung, moving in a confident manner. No hats. At 0200 hours till dawn, movement was heard, but unable to distinguish cause. Considerable troop movement both ways along the track. At 0635 hours, 27 Japs moved up track. These troops appeared fresh and were armed with LMGs and rifles, full heavy packs. Some had caps camouflaged with steel helmets on packs. These packs appeared larger than normal packs, blanket roll on pack. Three were carrying what appeared to be large map cases and four carrying bags in excessive packs in one group. Throughout night into early morning, barge movement heard. Highly probable troops moving up track had just been landed from barges heard. Their equipment and physical condition were not of troops brought back for rest. Our OP was within 50 yards of track and enemy is unaware of his being watched. With this invaluable new information now in allied hands, Wooten formulated a daring new operational plan, which he outlined to his brigadiers and senior officers at a conference on the 1st of November. Saddleberg, the mountain fortress, was the linchpin of the Japanese position. From this high ground, the largely intact 80th Regiment and its affiliate forces would still threaten the Australian logistical base at Scarlet Beach. Wooten could never be secure with it in Japanese hands. Therefore, it had to be taken before any coastal drive could be contemplated. Saddleberg was, thus, the division's primary objective. This task was given to Brigadier Whitehead's fresh men. This brigade would be supported by all of the division's resources, especially artillery. Despite the fearsome nature of the terrain, the Saddleberg Road itself was clear and flat enough that tanks could be employed. Despite the critical role tanks had played in the Papuan campaign, specifically at the Battle of Bunagona, thus far in New Guinea, the Allies had been unable to employ combined arms tactics. Armour was a critical advantage when facing heavily entrenched Japanese forces, and the tanks would have been invaluable in the advance through the Salankawa plantation but the Australians lacked the logistical support to move them forward. But now, Wooten had a squadron of the 1st Tank Battalion under his command, and he was sure that his 18 Matilda II tanks would be of great use in clearing the formidable Japanese defences along the track itself, especially as he was sure that they lacked heavy anti-tank artillery. He ordered Whitehead to begin training with the tanks at once in order to prepare for the main attack. On the northern flank, Wooten decided upon more bold action. It was clear to the general that in addition to Saddleberg, the mountain villages around Wareo, which dominated the most important track junctions, also had to be taken. An advance in this sector would cut the main supply route to Saddleberg, give the division access to the inland tracks, and, if Wareo itself could be taken in addition to Saddleberg, finally clear the Australian left flank. Thus, in concert with the drive on Saddleberg, the 24th Brigade, supported by the 20th, which had now taken over the central sector, would attack on the right and move to outflank the Japanese positions. With a steady stream of supply and reinforcement moving along the Waraio track from Gusika and Bonga to the main battle area, and an obvious Japanese inattention to their flanks and a lack of patrols, there was a real opportunity for a surprise attack. 
If a whole battalion could move through the jungle and occupy a good defensive position in the Japanese rear, cutting the Wario track, this would not only act as a diversion from the main attack at Saddleburg, but cut the primary Japanese supply line. This battalion would then entrench for 360 degree defense, relying on supply from the air. It was hoped that this would place Katagiri in an extremely difficult position. With simultaneous pressure being placed on Saddleburg and Wareo, and his forward units near Scarlet Beach now becoming ever more difficult to supply. The severity of the battle around Finchhafen and the near defeat of the 9th Division had generated a real moment of clarity at GHQ. MacArthur's reluctance to take the Australian report seriously had nearly precipitated a disaster. He was clearly chastened by how close run a thing the Battle of Finchhafen had become. Luckily for the Australians, the new Britain operation had been postponed by a number of weeks, and MacArthur ordered additional resources to be deployed to the Huon Peninsula. To support the Saddleburg Offensive, the 5th Air Force heavily targeted Japanese communications. Informed by captured documents, aerial reconnaissance, patrols, prisoners, and native informants, Allied intelligence now had a relatively clear picture of the Japanese supply system that was being employed in New Guinea. Naborewa, near Sio, was known to be the main logistical hub. It was here that barges and submarines operating from Rabaul would discharge their cargo. Supplies and troops then moved down the coast by barge, universally at night, to staging points at Salem Island, Kanomi, Walingai, Wandokai, and Lakona. Alternatively, men moved overland along the track recently taken by the 79th Regiment from Kalasa to Oreo. During the first week of November, this route received the unwanted attention of the 5th Air Force. As an example of these actions, on the 2nd of November, a squadron of P-47 Thunderbolts strafed and bombed suspected supply dumps around Nambariwa. Because they moved at night and were camouflaged by day, the barges were much more difficult to destroy by air attack. But soon the Japanese learned to dread the menace of American PT boats. These small and fast craft, armed with torpedoes, 50 caliber heavy machine guns and 20 millimeter orlicans, spent their nights stalking the New Guinea littorals hunting for the barge traffic upon which the Japanese relied so much. These operations were devastatingly effective. In just three nights on the first week of October, American sailors sank nine barges moving along the coast. In all, from the period of the 3rd of September to the 22nd of October, some 15 had been sent to the bottom, showing just how intense the barge hunting operation was becoming. The Japanese had no effective response to these light American vessels, which could move quickly and range widely, and were now based at Finchhafen. In all, these synergistic operations were having a serious impact on the 20th Division supply. On the 31st of October, 285 native men, women and children came through the Australian lines north of Scarlet Beach. These local people had been made refugees by the desperate Japanese, who were now so short of food that they had turned on the native population, raiding gardens, livestock and small holdings. Finally, on the 3rd of November, Brigadier Whitehead's fresh forces relieved the 20th Brigade at the critical Kumawa and Jivevenang positions. Despite some fierce fighting with Japanese elements around Kumawa and the Coconut Grove, by the 5th, the 2nd 24th Battalion was able to take over the fortifications held by the 2nd 17th. The battalion's diary records the last day the 2nd 17th spent at Jivevenang. It was a scene of desolation with bodies and equipment everywhere. The distance between the enemy positions and those of C Company varied from 3 yards near 14 platoon to 20 yards forward of 13 platoon. This gives some indication of the severity of the task which C Company undertook and how well they stuck to their job. We were now in the pleasant position of being able to hand over the area to the 2nd 24th Battalion clear of enemy. The work of the battalion had been of great tactical importance as the area could now be used as a base for further offensive operations against the enemy in the Saddleburg area. By the evening, the men were finally in the rear of the division's position at Heldsbach. They were skinny, gaunt and filthy, covered by the grime of a month of jungle fighting, yet their spirit remained unbroken. Outnumbered, nearly surrounded, and living without shelter in terrible, wet jungle terrain and without enough food, the men of the 2nd 17th had somehow maintained their cheery yet fighting spirit. They had truly been through hell and had single-handedly defeated the entire Japanese 80th Regiment, yet the price had been heavy. As the brigadier walked amongst the battalion, chatting to the men, one private remarked that, you'll have to get us some new mates 
There's only 11 left in our platoon. It took a further two weeks before the Saddleberg operation was finally ready, the massing of supplies and the movement of the tanks taking up the bulk of this time. By then, ample artillery ammunition was available, and nine tanks had arrived at Javevenang, ascending the treacherous Saddleberg Road. Wooten had nearly two full regiments of artillery deployed in the area. Whitehead's plan for the offensive rested upon three axes of attack, with each of his battalions simultaneously advancing on the towering Saddleberg height. The main advance would be made by the 2nd 48th Battalion. Starting at Chibevenang, and supported by the tanks of the 1st Tank Battalion, the 2nd 48th would attack straight up the Saddleberg Road. Here the defences were by far the strongest, and thus it was hoped that the tanks would be a decisive advantage. On the far left, the 2nd 23rd Battalion would advance from Kumawa along a minor track that ran parallel to the Saddleberg Road about one kilometre to the south. The Japanese had maintained a strong presence along the high ground in this area and had been in nearly constant battle with the 2nd 15th Battalion. Finally, on the right, the 2nd 24th Battalion would move to the north, cross the Siki Creek and advance up the Katika Track, down which the 79th Regiment had attacked Scarlet Beach, aiming to take a number of dominating high ground positions such as Point 2200. Here, the terrain was steepest and the jungle thickest, but it was thought that Japanese opposition was weakest. Nonetheless, as the terrain favoured the defender, and the 80th Regiment had shown no signs of collapse, all three battalions braced themselves for some very difficult fighting. In fact, for Whitehead's men, it would be their first taste of serious battle with the Japanese, and this would be no easy initiation. What confronted them was a baptism of fire that promised to include some of the toughest mountain fighting the Japanese and New Guinea had to offer but the veterans of Tobruk and El Alamein were up to the task. The attack began at 8.20am on the 16th of November. The act was opened by two batteries of 25-pounders and one company of the 2nd 2nd Machine Gun Battalion. For 20 minutes, the Japanese position at the Green Ridge near feature was peppered with artillery and machine gun fire, when at 8.35, this fire shifted to the far feature. As was so often the case in the New Guinea campaign, the infantry was slower than expected, and without radio communications with the artillery, the fire plan was unable to be amended. Thus, the infantry was unable to take full advantage of the suppressive effect of the bombardment. The bamboo was so thick and the ridge so narrow that the attacking company could simply not move quickly enough. Nonetheless, these features were not very strongly held, and by midday, both had fallen. The far ridge had been peppered by 26,000 rounds of Vickers machine gun fire, which had very effectively cut down much of the thick bamboo the Japanese were using as concealment, greatly aiding the job of the advancing infantry company. By nightfall, the battalion had advanced around 1,500 metres up the track. To their left, a company of the 2nd 23rd Battalion was moving along the Sissi track and had taken the sissi saddleberg track junction to the rear of Green Ridge. In all, the first day of the attack had gone well. The two companies of the 2nd 24th Battalion were preparing to move to the 2200 feature, but the main Japanese defences had not yet been engaged. Before the 2nd 48th Battalion stood the imposing Coconut Ridge, a high ground defensive position that dominated the Saddleberg Road and one that could not be as easily outflanked. Once this ridge and its dozens of Japanese bunkers had been cleared, the battalion had to take another imposing high ground feature, Steeple Tree Hill. For these two phases of the operation, in which the primary Japanese defences would be engaged, the Australians would deploy their armour with several tanks now ready at Jebevenang, eagerly waiting for the order to advance. On first light of the 17th, the quiet jungle morning air was broken by the rumble of tank engines. Three Matilda II tanks of Lieutenant O'Donnell's troop began slowly driving up the track towards the forward company of the 2nd 48th Battalion. The Matilda II was a first-generation infantry tank that had a very successful early war career with the British Army. Its heavy frontal armour specifically, in addition to its decent main armament, made the Matilda an effective tank in the early war, especially in the role it was designed for, infantry support. However, by 1942, it was clear that the Matilda had been rendered obsolete in the European and Mediterranean theatres by the steadily increasing lethality and capability of German anti-tank weaponry. The ubiquitous Pac-40, 75mm anti-tank gun, a weapon widely issued to German line infantry divisions, had made the Matilda's primary defensive capability, its armour, far less useful on European battlefields. Without the speed of the cruiser tanks, the Matilda was simply no longer a viable platform, 
and in June 1942, it was withdrawn from frontline British service. In 1942, Australia, however, was desperate for tanks. The nation was rapidly raising three armoured divisions, equivalent to a Panzer Corps, and given Canberra's low place on the Allied pecking order, it was happy to receive whatever armoured fighting vehicles it could get. Thus, the Matilda was warmly welcomed into Australian service. Most importantly, despite its obsolescence in Europe, the platform was still extremely viable in the Pacific, where the Japanese lacked the kind of large calibre, high velocity, anti-tank weaponry that had made the Mediterranean battlefields so dangerous for the Queen of the Desert. Still possessing its inherent virtues, in the jungles of the Southwest Pacific, it would serve the Australian Army well, right up until the end of the war. The attack of the 1st Tank Battalion would be conducted by a troop of four Matildas, which would advance in column up the Saddleberg Road. In the lead was a Matilda that was equipped with a 3-inch or 76mm howitzer, followed by a pair of more typical two-pounder models. These three tanks would be covered by a platoon of infantry, and then followed by Major Horden's headquarters tank, which would act as a radio link. Before the tanks left their start line, the Japanese position on the Coconut Ridge was devastated by an American rocket artillery barrage. The 7.2-inch demolition rocket deployed a 30-pound or 13.5-kilogram warhead which had a lethal effect of up to 50 yards. The impact of these weapons devastated the ridgeline, but the Australians were concerned by their inaccuracy. Suffering a high dud rate, many of these weapons not only missed the ridge, but failed to detonate. Despite having some effect on the defences, it was clear that most remained intact. As the tanks approached, the Saddleberg Road, little more than a narrow muddy track, wound its way up the mountain ridge before them, through dense jungle and bamboo thickets. The general plan of attack involved the tanks advancing to make contact with Japanese bunkers, suppressing them with automatic fire and allowing the supporting infantry to clear them with grenades, tactics which had worked well before. As the tanks rounded the first bend in the road, they began spraying the surrounding jungle with automatic fire, one covering the left, one the right. By 7.30, after the artillery bombardment had ceased, all that could be heard was the noise of the tanks, the rumble of their diesel engines only broken by the clatter of their machine guns. As they moved up the track, the 2nd 23rd Battalion moved across from Kumawa and occupied Green Ridge, allowing the whole 2nd 48th to focus on the attack towards Saddleberg. As the morning wore on, the tanks steadily drove up the track, finally meeting the first resistance after advancing about 50 metres. A stout Japanese pillbox opened up on the attackers, but its fire was only met with a deluge from the tank's main armament and coaxial machine guns. After this position was taken, the country became so thick that the tank commanders could not see anything, and thus simply fired blindly into the jungle, relying on the direction of the infantry commander. The Japanese had clearly not expected to see the tanks, but despite their surprise, they stubbornly held their positions. Several bunkers had to be destroyed by close-range 3-inch fire. For the crews of the Matildas, the excitement of their first engagement perhaps got the better of them. The Australian armoured formations had been raised in 1941. Originally intended to be deployed to the Western Desert, the 1st Armoured Division had been retained in the Southwest Pacific, where it would have been critical in any defensive campaign on the Australian continent. But as the Australian Army began to specialise in jungle warfare more and more, the importance and role of armour began to stagnate. The tanks simply remained in Australia, training incessantly for a set-piece battle on the open grasslands of Queensland and the Northern Territory that was never to come. Finally, in the last six weeks of 1943, four years into the war, the tankers of the 1st Battalion were seeing real action. They were, thus, understandably nervous and excited. But this eager exuberance led to a far too liberal expenditure of ammunition. With all three tanks spraying away at the surrounding jungle, Within minutes, they had exhausted their ammunition. The gunners were using 50-round bursts when as little as 10 would have had the same suppressive effect. By just 8.20, about halfway to their objective, the Coconut Ridge, the tanks had to stop and await resupply, bringing the attack to a standstill. Foreseeing this problem, the 1st Tank Battalion had pre-positioned jeeps at Javevenang which were fully loaded with machine gun ammunition. And although these were quickly brought forward, the process of resupplying the Matildas in contact with the enemy was a difficult one. As the tanks were struggling to advance up the Saddleberg Road, out in the jungle, the flank battalions were making steady progress. On the right, at 7.45am, 
Captain Hardy's company of the 2nd 24th, with Captain Mackenzie's following in close reserve, set out from their start line near the Siki Creek to assault the 2200 feature. This was essentially a small mountain that jutted out from the main ridge that ran towards the sea from Saddleberg Heights. It was key to the Japanese defences in this area. Moving through the steep jungle terrain, the Australians quickly crossed the Siki Creek and cut the Katika track, meeting no resistance in the process. As they ascended the steep slopes, they eventually found the main Japanese defences. Two hours later, the lead company reported finding the Japanese heavily entrenched on the summit, holding a trench complex in thick bamboo and jungle. On the left, the morning's attack went equally well, with Major Brown's company of the 2nd and 23rd Battalion advancing along the northwest track from Kumawa towards Steepletree. It met no opposition until it stumbled upon an enemy outpost along the track at the southern foot of the main spur. However, here the Japanese were as tenacious in defence as they had been around Chivevenang. Stopped cold, Colonel Tucker sent another company from Kumawa to reinforce Brown, and the two Australian formations fought to encircle the stubborn enemy position. By mid-morning, the tanks were back in action. Moving steadily up the road, the four steel beasts made good progress, routing one pocket of Japanese infantry out of their bunkers after another. The road, as much as the resistance, proved to be a hindrance. The narrow and muddy track with tight bends required a careful advance. By 11.30, things seemed to be going well. The first tank had made it to the base of the Coconut Ridge, and casualties had been light. But disaster was about to strike. As the lead tank rounded a narrow bend, it was rocked by an explosion. Something had blown off its track. Initially concerned that they may have driven into a minefield, the culprit was later determined to be an unexploded 25-pounder round. The lead tank was rendered immobile and, because it was around a tight bend, the following vehicle could not tow it out. Furthermore, the track was so narrow and the drop-off so steep that there was no way that the other vehicles could pass. As the tankers tried to rescue the stranded Matilda, they were raked with heavy and accurate Japanese machine gun fire, driving the infantry back. The fire was so heavy that the tank crews could not leave their vehicles. At one point, a brave group of Japanese soldiers crept up to the tank, so close that the gunners could not depress their weapons far enough to engage them. One man threw a satchel charge onto Tomlin's tank. Although the tough Matilda shrugged off the explosion, the Bisa machine gun was forced back into the tank, wounding a member of the crew. The Matildas had shown their value, but this country was so steep and the track so narrow that effectively employing them in such terrain was proving to be a real challenge. With this setback befalling them, the 2nd 48th Battalion decided to press on without the tanks. They were now at the base of their first objective, the Coconut Ridge. Moving beyond the stranded Matildas, two platoons attacked a kunai grass-covered knoll located at the edge of the ridge, taking it after a brief but intense firefight. In the afternoon, they both assaulted the main Japanese defences on the ridge itself. The ground here had been heavily damaged by the preparatory artillery bombardment, and shattered trees and craters hindered the attack. Clambering over tree trunks, the men were easy targets for the defenders, who poured rifle and machine gun fire into them. Eventually, the company became pinned about 15 metres from the Japanese trenches. Only a single section made it to the actual defences, driving the Japanese back and killing 19 enemy in the process, but it soon became clear that this position was untenable. The narrow nature of the ridge and the tough defences conspired to make this far too tough a challenge for two-thirds of a rifle company, and the Australians decided to retreat, regroup, and attack again in the morning. On the far left and right flanks, a similar situation had developed. Despite rapid early progress, both battalions had been stopped at the main Japanese defences, and as dusk fell, the lead companies dug in around these positions. The defenders had enjoyed weeks to strengthen these fortifications, and were greatly aided by the nature of the terrain, which provided excellent defensive fields of fire and the cover of jungle and bamboo thickets. Throughout the war, the Japanese had shown a real aptitude for the construction and effective employment of field fortifications, a talent they were displaying again along the Saddleberg Road. It was becoming clear that taking Saddleberg was going to be a tough and costly operation. As night fell, a perimeter was formed around O'Donnell's disabled tank. The crew had not been able to leave the vehicle for eight hours. After disabling the tank, they abandoned it. The Matilda had certainly done its part. Although disabled, like a great pillbox, the vehicle had poured supporting fire into the Japanese positions all throughout the day. 
it alone had fired some 120 3-inch howitzer shells. At first light, the 2nd 48th dispatched a patrol to ascertain the situation on the Coconut Ridge. The hill, once lushly adorned with thick jungle, was now little more than a grey cratered wasteland, devastated by the effects of Allied artillery and air bombardment. As the patrol crept towards the Japanese positions, they heard no sounds and detected no movement. Sensing an opportunity, Captain Morford immediately ordered his lead platoon to advance and, as expected, they found the primary Japanese position on the ridge abandoned. Orders were quickly passed to the tanks, and with the road cleared, a reserve troop was able to carefully drive around the disabled Matilda. By midday, two tanks could be seen on the ridge as tank infantry teams cleared out the remaining Japanese positions. The damaged vehicles, the second of which had become stuck trying to extricate the first, were both rapidly repaired and brought back into action. On the left flank, progress was painfully slow. By outflanking the Japanese defences, the 2nd 23rd were able to precipitate a Japanese withdrawal. But, as the Japanese just moved from one set of pre-prepared defences to another a little further up the spur, progress was only made at a snail's pace. They were getting closer to the Saddleberg Road now and figured they were about 400 metres away. If they could reach it, they would have bypassed the main Japanese defences on the Coconut Ridge and Steeple Tree. But every time they had attempted to flank the Japanese, they had run into yet more opposition, occupying yet another series of pre-prepared defences. They were told to hold their positions as the 2nd 48th was about to resume the attack up the main track. Despite now holding Coconut Ridge, the imposing position named by the Australians Steeple Tree remained. The Coconut Ridge and the spur where the 2nd 23rd were still trying to drive in the Japanese left flank were all part of the one Japanese defensive complex. This line of high ground terminated on the steeple tree feature, with the ridge flattened out before ascending to Saddleberg Height itself. Whitehead figured that, given the strength of the Japanese defenses and the ferocity of the resistance encountered here, the steeple tree was probably the main Japanese defensive position, short of Saddleberg itself. But there were several small knolls and higher ground positions between the Coconut Ridge and this main defensive position. On the 17th, the 2nd 48th attacked up the main track and, again, was greeted by savage Japanese resistance. Here the defenders were actually employing 37mm anti-tank guns, but in a number of desperate, close-range duels, these were all knocked out by the tanks. Here, on two small knolls, one behind the other, the Japanese had again entrenched heavily. Fighting from bunkers and trenches, they stood their ground and fought, often to the death. Many positions were literally driven over by the tanks. Here the fighting was hand to hand, and despite taking the first hill, the Australians could not take the second. During the combat in this area, the Japanese had employed numerous tree snipers. These were really nothing more than riflemen who had climbed tall trees to take pot shots at the men as they advanced up the Saddleberg Road. Most were situated on an opposing hill just to the east. Although in the big picture these snipers were a little more than a nuisance, they were utterly hated. The fear of being shot by an unseen enemy sitting on a far hill magnified the relatively minor material impact these snipers had. But, in a turn of fate, during the afternoon, as the sun dropped it clearly illuminated the far hill. Now these hidden snipers were in clear and bright sunlight and the best shots in the battalion took great pleasure in picking these men off one by one. Six had been killed before nightfall. With the wider Japanese defensive complex now becoming more apparent to Australian command, the 2nd 23rd Battalion dispatched a company to try and outflank the whole Japanese position. Conducting a wide left hook, this formation advanced some 800 metres without encountering any Japanese resistance until it reached a track. Firmly believing it had cut the Saddleberg Road, the company commander relayed this information to Battalion HQ, which then led Brigadier Whitehead to alter his operational plan. Facing strong resistance up the main road, he was lured by this apparent success to potentially shift the weight of the attack to the left flank. However, the company had only cut a minor track, not the main road, and this only served to confuse Australian command. Throughout the 18th and 19th of November, the 2nd 48th continued to make slow progress. Despite the ferocity of the defences encountered, often daybreak would reveal the Japanese had abandoned positions that seemed impregnable the day before. As the tanks and infantry set off in the morning, they took the second hill with relative ease, only meeting sporadic resistance. 
they were now advancing up the final section of road towards the tallest feature on the ridge, Steeple Tree. Although they were surprised by the employment of armour, the Japanese rapidly reacted. As they advanced, the tanks found the first of several obstacles. A tank trap had been dug along the road, which was covered by Japanese machine gun positions. It could only be bridged by the pioneers once the supporting infantry had cleared the enemy out of their trenches with bayonet and Owen gun. Several more of these obstacles were encountered, each slowing down the advance further. Facing the 2nd 48th Battalion was yet another strong enemy position on a large feature that dominated a bend in the Saddleberg Road just before Steeple Tree. The combination of anti-tank obstacles and heavy and accurate automatic fire proved to be a nearly insurmountable challenge. The infantry could not clear the defences without the tanks, but the tanks could not pass the tank ditch. Finally, the sappers could not deal with the tank ditch until the infantry silenced the machine guns. To deal with these formidable defences, the Australians turned to an ingenious technical solution, a fugace. The fugace was originally developed in the early Renaissance period as an improvised piece of artillery. The fugace was formed by digging a large hole in the ground, which would act as a chamber and barrel. This was then filled with explosive and a projectile, creating an impromptu artillery piece. The British had developed a kind of incendiary fugace, which was more of an improvised explosive device, as opposed to a mortar, which they had been planning to use in the defence of southern England. Called a flame fugace, this IED was typically employed as a mine. When initiated, the fugace would act as an impromptu flamethrower, projecting burning liquid into a predefined kill box, as opposed to a traditional projectile. A flame fugace was made by filling a steel container, such as a 40-gallon drum, with a mixture of incendiary liquid. At the base of the drum, a small explosive charge was used to both rupture the steel and propel a jet of liquid out of the nozzle at the other end, which was typically lit by some form of ignition device. When fired, the flame full gas would project a jet of burning liquid towards the enemy, drenching the kill box in flame. Lieutenant Spry of the 2nd 13th Field Company was ordered to prepare two flame fugaces which he did by filling a pair of 40-gallon drums with a mixture of petroleum and diesel. After these had been filled and wired with explosive, Spry and his men dragged the two weapons forward, quietly emplacing them just a few metres from the Japanese position. Spry hoped that these would create a large smoke screen in addition to the unlikely outcome that they might actually inflict any enemy casualties, which would at least cover the approaching infantry. At 5.45pm, Spry electronically detonated the two weapons, and two bright yellow jets of burning liquid flew towards the enemy, each reaching the Japanese about 30 metres away. Unfortunately for the Australians, the liquid burned so quickly that within mere seconds the fire had burned out and the smoke had cleared, but nonetheless, the weapon had its desired effect. Badly shaken by the surprise employment of incendiary weapons, the Japanese looked down to see Lieutenant Barry's platoon charging behind fixed bayonets and cheering, Ho, ho, ho! as though the Australians were fighting on the open fields of Waterloo rather than the dense jungles of New Guinea. Nonetheless, as had happened so many other times in this campaign, fighting spirit and boldness had achieved what firepower and tanks could not. The diary of the 2nd 48th reads, The men advanced across the ground shoulder to shoulder, with Bren and Owen guns blazing from the hip and the riflemen hurling grenades. Badly shaken by the fugace, and with Barry's men now in the trenches and amongst them, Japanese resistance began to falter. Supported by McKinnon's platoon on the left, the Japanese gave up their first line of defense, and, with brutal hand-to-hand -hand fighting, where many men met their fate at the end of a bayonet, the attackers took the ridge. Realizing the importance of this feature, the Japanese immediately counterattack, and as darkness fell, desperate battle raged along the hilltop. This counter-attack was so fierce that every man had to fight, with sappers, drivers and headquarters staff joining the battle. This was a close-run thing, and the Australians were on the verge of being driven back, but in the end, it was the intervention of armour that decided the issue. Although they could not pass the tank ditch at the now-named Fugas Corner, the Matildas were able to pour fire into the attacking Japanese, finally driving them back. During the day of battle, the 2nd 48th had suffered 20 casualties, with 4 killed. They claimed to have killed 46 Japanese, as well as capturing 7 machine guns and 5 mortars. Despite the ferocity of battle at Fugas Corner on the 19th, the attack resumed on the 20th. 
a relentlessness that exemplified the Australian approach to the task of jungle offense. Infantry patrols led the tanks forward, but progress slowed to a snail's pace. That day, it was not the indomitable fighting spirit of the Japanese that slowed the 2nd 48th, but simply New Guinea itself. The battalion's diarist wrote of the day's attack, Some idea of the difficult nature of the country can be gained from the fact that it had taken B Company 1 hour 50 minutes to traverse 250 yards. Except for the narrow track, this area was a mass of thick bamboo, impossible to penetrate except by crawling on hands and knees. The hill, which was known to the Australians as Steeple Tree, was defended by another dense complex of Japanese fortifications. These were designed to cover every avenue of approach, and were routinely sited in thick bamboo groves, making them impossible to see until they opened fire, something the Japanese would typically only do at grenade throwing distance. Although each one was not held in great strength, they would have required a very careful approach by infantry alone. But with the tanks, the Australians were able to make slow but steady progress without suffering immense casualties. Typically, a single platoon would engage one of these bunkers with a tank in support, whilst a second platoon would wheel around the flank. The major problem with these tactics was simply how thick the jungle was. As soon as the tank moved off the road, it was blind and had to be effectively walked onto a target by the supporting infantry. But through this deliberate attack, which relied heavily on combined arms tactics, the Japanese positions were taken one at a time, the tanks suppressing and the infantry moving in for the kill. Although this approach was undeniably effective, it was slow. Despite only advancing a couple of hundred meters, it took the second 48th all day to clear this final hilltop. It was 4.40 p.m. before the battalion reported the capture of Steeple Tree. All along the ridge, Japanese fortifications were discovered, some complete with overhead cover, some unfinished and still in the process of construction. It was an immensely impressive defensive complex, and without the tanks, the cost it would have extracted in Australian blood would have been far more severe. At nightfall, the victorious battalion settled in another 360 degree perimeter defending the tanks. With the fall of the steeple tree feature, the primary Japanese defensive line had been breached. On the left, the 2nd 23rd Battalion had finally made contact with the 2nd 48th and had succeeded in rooting out the last stubborn pocket of resistance separating the two battalions. At first light, the Australians continued the advance up the road and, to their shock, met little resistance. The Japanese had fought ferociously for every single minor terrain feature on the Saddleberg Road. Every hill, every ridge, every turn in the road. For five days, the battle had been constant, violent and vicious. Many Japanese men had refused to abandon their positions, preferring death to withdrawal. But now, the forward patrols only found the odd straggler. At first contact, a party of 15 simply abandoned their weapons and fled. Eventually, they came across the remains of a field hospital which showed signs of many wounded and a large number of graves were discovered. These were good indications that the steeple tree feature was the main centre of Japanese defences other than Saddleberg itself. Out on the right flank, on the Katika track, the 2nd 24th Battalion was still unable to make any headway at all. The 2200 feature was so firmly held and the terrain was so steep that, despite five days of attempts, no impression was made. Even an attempt to cut the Katika track behind the Japanese position did not compel them to withdraw. Wooten decided that the employment of tanks on this flank might speed things up, but it would require the construction of a road, and thus several days for them to reach this exposed position. As the 26th Brigade made its gruelling, grinding attack on the Coconut Ridge and Steeple Tree, where every yard had to be paid for in blood, be it Australian or Japanese, in the north, on the far right flank, the 24th Brigade was encountering entirely different circumstances. After their skillful and determined defense of Scarlet Beach, where the Japanese attack had been fiercest and the fighting hottest, the men of the 24th Brigade were incensed at the idea that the battle had not been fought well. Their CO, Brigadier Evans, had been relieved of command. Though the brigade had performed well, General Wooten had determined that Evans had needlessly given up vital ground and not followed his orders. Generally speaking, Evans was well liked by his men, who thought him an able brigadier. The diary of one of the battalions noted their regret at his leaving the front. Whether or not this action was reasonable or warranted, Brigadier Evans was headed back to Australia.
his replacement came in the highly experienced and capable form of Brigadier Porter. Porter had commanded the 2nd 31st Battalion throughout the North African Campaign, and had ably led the 30th Brigade throughout the gruelling Battle of Bunagona. Porter noticed the dip in morale caused by Evans' replacement. The proud men of the brigade were all uncomfortable with the implication that there was something wrong with the victory they had won. But Porter immediately impressed. Every bit the soldier soldier, the tall and affable brigadier, immediately went down well with his new command, and morale again returned. By the 15th of November, Porter was now ready to launch a daring surprise attack in the northern sector. The main track used by the Japanese to supply the Warreo and Saddleberg areas ran along the coast from Sio to the villages of Gusika and Bonga, where it began winding its way inland up through the hills. For well over a week now, an Australian observation post, largely manned by members of the ever-invaluable Papuan Infantry Battalion, arguably the best jungle reconnaissance troops in the world, had been watching a steady stream of Japanese movements up and down this critical track. Fresh reinforcements, with weapons and heavy packs busily moving up the track, followed by heavily laden porters, and unarmed and poorly clothed walking wounded lazily wandering down it. The Australians were surprised by their ability to operate in this area, about 5 kilometers away from friendly lines, for so long without detection. There were clearly large Japanese forces in the area, but these were generally remaining in their high ground positions like Pino Hill, and not patrolling effectively. There was an obvious opportunity here. In any case, Porter had been ordered by Wooten to launch an offensive in this area, and after thorough examination of the ground, both on foot and through aerial photographs, he decided that seizing a high ground position which dominated the track could well be decisive. If one of these high ground features could be taken in a coup de main, this critical line of communication would be permanently severed. Such a blow could well prove fatal to the Japanese forces trying to defend Saddleberg. Right next to the Australian post that had been observing the Warreo track was an imposing feature, a tall knoll that dominated the wider ridge along which the track ran. The hill itself was in excellent position, eminently defensible and with a clear field of fire dominating the track. If it could be taken, it would fatally compromise the entire Japanese position in the saddleberg Warreo area the Papuans reported that it was undefended. Sensing the opportunity that the Japanese had presented them, all the officers of the brigade agreed that it should be their objective. The only disagreement came from the fact that the hill didn't have a name. What should we call it? asked Porter. This innocuous question led to a robust debate amongst the Australian officers, but despite many ideas and a vigorous argument, agreement could not be reached. Tired of the back and forth, Porter turned to a young Papuan boy who had been acting as Major Mollard's trusted personal servant and liaison, who, as usual, was present at the meeting. Before the war, the young man had been employed by Mollard, an officer of the 2nd 32nd Battalion, and had now been with him for well over a year. Porter bluntly asked the boy, What's your name? Pabu, he replied. Thus, it was decided. The position was to be named Pabu Hill, which was just shortened to Pabu. Like the Pimple, Shaggy Ridge, Bob Doobie, and La Barbia before it, this young lad's name would be given to an unknown, remote terrain feature, some obscure hill in the wilderness of New Guinea, one which would fade back into obscurity after the war. But in November 1943, Pabu would be the scene of some of the Australian Army's greatest exploits. The battalion, less one company, left Scarlet Beach on the afternoon of the 19th of November. The men were heavily laden with an average pack weight of 80 pounds. They were led by the ever able Papuans who expertly led the whole battalion around the now well-known Japanese positions. Their Australian allies were sure that the Papuans could literally smell the Japanese from hundreds of yards. They didn't even need to see the enemy to avoid him. Pabu was only about 5 kilometers from Scarlet Beach, but the march took the men through difficult, hilly country. The thick kunai grass and jungle meant the battalion had to bivouac overnight a short distance from their objective. After camping about a mile from Pabu, the lead companies approached their attack start lines. By some miracle, the whole battalion had advanced between the Japanese positions undetected, and after a very short artillery bombardment, were able to take this vital position without sustaining a single casualty. The Japanese were holding another hill just 300 metres away, and thanks to the boldness of their officers and the skill of the Papuan guides, 
the Australians were able to take Pabu from right under their noses. By midday of the 20th, three infantry companies were holding the lower slopes, arranged for 360 degree defence, and higher up the hill, a number of Vickers guns and three inch mortars dominated the approaches. Although heavily wooded themselves, Pabu and its sibling hills were surrounded by tall kunai grass rather than jungle and bamboo thickets, giving the Australians excellent fields of fire. To further remove this cover, they immediately lit much of the grass ablaze with tracer fire, and within hours, the primary avenues of approach were completely devoid of both cover and concealment. The heavily forested hill was described by one Australian soldier as an island of jungle now surrounded by wide open spaces. As the fires were still burning, 150 native carriers arrived with ample food, water and ammunition. By 2pm, Pabu had taken its first Japanese victims. Despite all the fires burning around them, a platoon of Japanese men were seen wandering nonchalantly down the track, chatting to each other with rifles slung lazily over their shoulders. The clearly visible column of men walked into the Vickers guns field of fire. Twelve were killed in the first burst, and the rest scattered, falling back to whatever cover they could find. Porter knew that by taking this hill deep behind the Japanese forward positions, he would be poking the hornet's nest, and the artillery had already worked out a defensive fire plan that would cover the approaches and primary Japanese axis of attack. Pabu dominated one of the only lines of communication connecting the 80th Regiment around Saddleburg with CO. With Whitehead's brigade slowly encroaching on the Japanese mountain fortress, this enemy incursion was all the more threatening. The Australians had to expect a strong reaction. But again, the Japanese exceeded their expectations. General Adachi, the 18th Army commander and highest ranking officer in New Guinea, had never given up hope of regaining Finchhafen and driving the 9th Division back into the sea. Adachi was showing why he had a reputation as an aggressive and fighting general, one he had earned in China. Despite the ferocity of the 20th Division's October counteroffensive, the 79th Regiment had received an utter mauling at the hands of the 24th Brigade. Given the carnage witnessed on the battlefields around Scarlet Beach and Jabivanang, it seemed to the Australian officers that the 20th Division was not capable of launching another major offensive. But the ever-aggressive Adachi urged his divisional commander, Katagiri, to try once again to wrestle the initiative away from Wooten and the Australians. Despite the quality of their defensive fortifications and positions, if left to its own devices, the 9th Division was likely to slowly squeeze the Japanese out of their mountain stronghold one ridge at a time. Although badly depleted, the 79th Regiment was not yet a beaten fighting force. It may have been reeling from its defeat around the Song River, but it was not quite a broken formation. Reinforced by the 2nd Battalion, 238th Regiment, the 79th now had a frontline strength of around 3,600 men, and unbeknownst to the Allies, Katagiri was planning another large-scale counterattack. Just as the 2nd 32nd moved through the jungle towards Pabu, large Japanese forces were preparing to attack Scarlet Beach from the north. These were immediately encountered. Yet again, poor Japanese operational security betrayed them. Just as they had several times throughout the Huon Peninsula campaign, the Australians captured Katagiri's operational orders. Three documents were found after clashes with Australian patrols. For some inexplicable reason, Japanese junior officers continued to operate in the forward battle area carrying detailed orders, a godsend for Allied intelligence. In addition to this captured documentation, on the 22nd of November, a patrol found that the overnight bivouac area the battalion had used on its march to Pabu was now a Japanese battalion headquarters. It became immediately clear to the Australians at Pabu that the enemy dispositions had radically changed. Contact was made with enemy forces all around the perimeter, and once uneventful patrols constantly clashed with Japanese elements. Private Ritchie, writing of the Siege of Pabu later, remarked that, We were now an Australian island in a Japanese sea. The Australian occupation of Pabu had clearly caused severe disruption to the Japanese offensive plans. The captured orders indicated that Katagiri was intending a repeat of the offensive which had nearly brought him victory in October. The reinforced 79th Regiment was to attack Scarlet Beach once again, with the objective of annihilating the Australian forces in the Song River area, rather than around Saddleburg. But now, there was an enemy battalion 5 kilometers in his rear, dominating his communications. Despite their obvious presence, small parties of Japanese were still trying to use the track, and on the 22nd, Australian gunners accounted for several. 
By the evening of the 22nd, the Japanese were starting to react to this incursion. From their position on Pino Hill, between Pabu and Scarlet Beach, the Japanese brought forward one of their few artillery pieces. Lack of heavy weapons was a critical Japanese weakness throughout the campaign, and the employment of one of these precious weapons, and their equally precious ammunition, indicated just how threatening the Australian possession of Pabu was. In the evening, the 75mm weapon began its bombardment, and immediately the defenders began to suffer casualties. Within just a few minutes, A Company had lost 19 men, five of whom were killed. This included the CO, Captain Walker, and a platoon commander, Lieutenant Lewis. It was clear that they were now completely surrounded. Porter had instructed his engineers to construct a jeep track to supply Pabu, and native porters were going to be used until it had been completed. But with telephone communication severed and strong Japanese elements now between Scarlet Beach and Pabu, it was clear to all that the 2nd 32nd Battalion was now cut off and under siege. Despite lacking any communication with his battalion, Porter immediately began preparations for supplying Pabu by air. But beyond that, there was nothing more he could do. Mollard and the 2nd 32nd Battalion were on their own. The main focus of the Japanese offensive was the Australian position to the north of the Song River. This area was held by the 2nd 43rd Battalion, a position which was founded on the high ground around North Hill. Three companies held the high ground here, with one deployed to block the coastal track which ran from Bonga to Scarlet Beach. The beachhead itself was held by the 2nd 28th and a company of the 2nd 32nd. General Katagiri's operational plan included a two-pronged attack, with the 2nd Battalion, 238th Regiment, attacking the 2nd 43rd Battalion along the coast, whilst the balance of the 79th Regiment would both attack and bypass these Australian positions and strike the beachhead from the same direction they had in October, utilising the inland route. In order to avoid detection and Australian patrols, the commander of the 79th Regiment, Colonel Hayashida, ordered his men to avoid the main tracks and move across country. This had its desired effect, but given the nature of the terrain, it also rapidly disorganised his now exhausted command. In the coastal sector, the Australians could hear the Japanese moving all around their positions, with officers shouting to their men and the sounds of digging and movement. Outposts clashed with small Japanese elements, but as the morning wore on, no massed attack came. It rapidly became clear that the Japanese had changed their tactics. Australian jungle warfare doctrine had evolved substantially by the end of 1943. Infantry companies and battalions were now not typically deployed in a continuous line, with one keeping contact with the other. It was quickly realised that in the mountainous jungles of New Guinea, even attempting to maintain that kind of a divisional deployment was simply counterproductive. Not only did it prevent the division from dominating enough terrain, it spread its forces so thinly that it could not, in fact, prevent enemy incursions and infiltrations, the primary benefit of maintaining a line. Instead, Wooten and the Australians simply accepted that the Japanese would get in between their positions. Each battalion would dominate a geographically important terrain feature and arrange for 360 degree defence. Within the battalion, the individual rifle companies would often deploy in a similar fashion, in effect making each battalion position a series of small, fortified, company-level outposts. This allowed the Australians to dominate a far larger area effectively, but it meant the Japanese were going to be able to reach the rear areas of the division if they tried hard enough. To mitigate this shortcoming, these more vulnerable facilities and positions, such as artillery, logistics, hospitals and brigade command posts, were also strongly held and fortified in a similar fashion. This made Japanese infiltration far less dangerous, as there were, in effect, no weak points they could exploit. The Australian position was, thus, not a hard but brittle crust, protecting the division's vitals, but rather a number of defensive positions arranged in depth. To dominate the space between these often widely dispersed battalion and company positions, the Australians relied upon patrols rather than a permanent presence, and brigade and divisional commanders always maintained a strong reserve that could rapidly drive out any large enemy incursion. Throughout the Huon Peninsula campaign, indeed the wider Papuan and New Guinea campaigns, the Japanese had relied on infiltration to move between the forward Australian positions and attack more vital areas. But when those attacks came, they were powerfully concentrated. Katagiri's October counter-offensive had relied upon moving through the jungle between these widely separated defences to attack critical points, such as Scarlet Beach. But the assaults themselves were rarely made in anything less than company strength. During the Battle of Finchhafen, Australian companies would have to face massed, 
Japanese chargers, hundreds of screaming men hurling themselves at the defending gun line. These fearsome attacks had put immense pressure on several battalions and forced Brigadier Evans to abandon Katika in order to strengthen his line around Scarlet Beach. But there was a price to pay for how formidable these assaults were. When beaten back, the Japanese were forced to withdraw from an Australian gun line that was now littered with dead and dying men. The firepower the Australians were able to bring to bear on these attacks rapidly imposed devastating casualties. The harder they were pressed, the higher the cost to the attackers. Despite their near success, Katagiri and the 79th Regiment in general had clearly been scarred by the mauling they had received at the hands of the 9th Division. In order to avoid these devastating casualties, the Japanese switched to infiltration tactics. Rather than employing massed company or battalion attacks, small groups of infantry tried to move in between the Australian positions, with the aim of threatening their rear and causing confusion and disorganisation. But rather than achieving its aim, this change in tactical approaches actually played into Australian strength. Even if they got between the forward companies, small bands of Japanese infantry were not going to reach the division's vital areas, which were all protected, and the battalions were all arranged for 360 degree defence, meaning there was no vulnerable rear or flank to exploit. Rather than sow confusion and disorganisation, these new tactics did little more than dilute the power of the Japanese attack. Indeed, once it became clear what Katagiri and Hayashida were trying to do, Wushin and Porter were relieved rather than concerned. The experience of D Company, 2nd 43rd Battalion, illustrates the weakness of this new approach. Captain Gordon's company had been ordered to block the main track that ran between the battalion's main position on North Hill and the coast. Facing them was the bulk of the fresh 2nd Battalion, 238th Regiment. Gordon's position was not an especially strong one. He had deployed one of his rifle platoons a few hundred metres forward along the track. At first light, Lieutenant Foley's platoon could hear the enemy all around them, talking loudly and chopping down trees. These forces soon reached the company's position to the rear, but rather than the attack Gordon expected, the Japanese were seen moving around his flanks in section strength groups. After engaging an element of platoon strength, Foley decided that his men were too exposed and he moved them back to the company. It was clear that Gordon was facing a much larger force, several companies in strength. But as the day wore on, the much-feared Banzai charge failed to materialize. Instead, the defenders were constantly engaged in reasonably low-intensity skirmishing all along the perimeter. The Japanese came on in ones and twos, rather than hundreds. This lack of concentration and mass did nothing more than weaken the attack. The after-action reports indicate how small these skirmishes were. At about 1pm, the anti-tank platoon guarding the battalion headquarters immediately north of the Song reported seeing a few Japanese on their right flank. A lion party from the 2nd 28th Battalion killed four Japanese south of Gordon's position. At 2pm, three Japanese were killed in a creek west of battalion headquarters. An hour later, a prisoner was captured behind Gordon's company, who revealed that he was a member of the 2nd Battalion 238th Regiment, and a force of two companies had been ordered to attack in this sector. Had they concentrated for a powerful attack, they may well have overwhelmed Gordon's lone company. But by 5pm, the fighting had died down so much that Gordon decided to regain the initiative. He dispatched a patrol at last light that could not find any Japanese within 100 yards of the perimeter. In the end, the attack along the coast had been defeated with surprising ease. As this action was taking place along the coast, the main body of the 79th Regiment was approaching the main battalion positions on North Hill. Katagiri's plan was again good, at least in concept. The primary Australian defences north of the Song would be pinched out by a simultaneous attack of several of the 79th Regiment's battalions, where the Japanese could amass a force ratio advantage of 3 to 1, in addition to an attack on the beachhead itself. As Brigadier Porter viewed his defences, he was not entirely satisfied. The Australian positions at Scarlet Beach lacked depth, but there really wasn't all that much he could do given the time constraints. At Scarlet Beach, he had amassed a powerful reserve of two companies, roughly half a battalion, one each from the 2nd 32nd and 2nd 28th. But as the morning sun rose, the fierce attack failed to materialize. The country through which Hayashida's men had to advance had slowed and disordered them considerably. Along the coast, it was clear that Gordon's company was holding. The only real concern was Pabu, 
This was obviously the most exposed position, and Porter decided that the 4th Rifle Company of the 2nd 32nd would be of far better use there than at the beachhead. He ordered Captain Lancaster to leave immediately for Pabu. His route would take him inland of the 2nd 43rd's position on North Hill. They departed at 10.30am, and by midday were a few hundred metres beyond the 2nd 43rd's foxholes, moving parallel to the Australian line. Just at that very moment, the Japanese were also approaching North Hill. The right arm of the Japanese pincers, Hayashida's vanguard, had finally arrived and was preparing to attack the 2nd 43rd in conjunction with the 2nd Battalion, 238th Regiment along the coast. As Lancaster's men advanced, they began to skirmish with groups of Japanese to their front. Rather than minor clashes with small patrols, these actions soon evolved into fierce firefights, and it became clear that his company had crossed paths with a strong Japanese force moving on North Hill. The Japanese were not expecting this flank attack, and as they advanced, Hayashida's forces became pinned between Lancaster and the 2nd 43rd. Much like the Battle of Wau, by simple good luck, the Australians had flanked the attacking Japanese force. There were now two Australian formations on high ground to either side of the Serpine Creek, which formed a deep ravine just to the north of the 2nd 43rd's positions. This was clearly the Japanese staging area from which they were planning to attack North Hill. But with the surprise approach of Lancaster and the resolute and aggressive defence of Captain Richmond's company on North Hill, the attackers were now forced to defend a highly vulnerable piece of terrain. Clearly, a significant Japanese formation was now concentrated in this narrow gully. They were prime targets for an artillery bombardment. Within minutes, this small gully was plastered by 200 3-inch mortar shells. Reeling from this punishing bombardment, the Japanese withdrew. By nightfall, Lancaster's men had cleared the valley. They found nothing there but 43 dead Japanese men. Surrounded by their slain enemies, the company bivouacked for the night. Outflanked before it had begun, the 79th Regiment's main attack had been badly blunted by Lancaster's surprise flank attack, and then shattered by the power of the battalion's mortars. By dusk on the 22nd, it was clear to both Wooten and Porter that the Japanese attack had already been defeated. Clearly, the once mighty fighting spirit of the 79th Regiment had been, at least partially, broken by the hellish battles of October. The offensive in general simply lacked the ferocity of its predecessor. The attempt to use infiltration tactics had produced no results for the Japanese. Indeed, the lack of mass and concentration had squandered the opportunities they actually had on the 22nd. In the words of the Australian official history, infiltration could never win a battle against the tactics employed by the Australians in the last year or more. The day's battle cost the Japanese 89 killed in action, in addition to an unknown number of wounded. On the 22nd of November, the 2nd 43rd Battalion had only lost one man killed. There could be no doubt of the size of the force that had attacked North Hill. The following morning, over 1,000 hastily dug foxholes were found all around the battalion's perimeter. As Porter was breaking Katagiri's counter-attack with surprising ease, the tough battle along the Saddleburg Road resumed. With the capture of Steepletree, Brigadier Whitehead had reached his first phase objective. Although the fighting had been extremely tough, the first line of defence had been broken. But towering before him stood the main prize, Saddleburg itself. His operational plan was not remarkably different from the attack on the Steepletree position. The 2nd 48th Battalion would continue the main effort up the Saddleburg Road, which took a hard right turn at Turn Off Corner, and then wound up the steep slopes to the summit. This force would be supported by a tank troop. Out on the left flank, the 2nd 23rd Battalion would execute a long left hook, aiming to take the 3200 feature, the crest of a mountain just behind Saddleburg. Finally, on the right, across the Siki Creek, the 2nd 24th Battalion would continue attacking from the east it had still not taken the formidable Japanese position it had first encountered. Thus, the three battalions would converge on the 80th Regiment from three directions. But, if anything, the terrain here was more difficult than at Coconut Ridge. As the tanks drove up the road, it became more precipitous, with high ground on one side and a steep drop-off on the other. Within a few hundred metres from Turn Off Corner, the tanks were stopped in their tracks. A large landslide had covered the road, and the surrounding ground was shattered by shellfire. On the left, the 2nd 32nd Battalion was advancing towards the high ground, but the terrain here made navigation difficult. After gaining a ridgeline, they had thought the battalion was near their objective, but they were in fact much closer to the Saddleburg Road and the 2nd 48th Battalion. 
hampered by a thick, wooded country, wings of both formations nearly stumbled into one another. The only thing that prevented a deadly friendly fire incident was loud shouts of ho ho ho, a strange Australian code word that had now saved many lives. The terrain here was so steep and forested that it alone could well prevent any advance. It was, in the words of the battalion diarist, New Guinea jungle at its worst. From the flat Saddleberg Plateau, the mountain steeply dropped off on all sides. Here the road crossed the Siki Creek at a major ford. This position was dominated by heavily entrenched Japanese elements, with fortified medium machine guns arranged with interlocking fields of fire. These could not be seen given the thickness of the vegetation, but their fire immediately halted the battalion as it tried to cross the ford. It was quickly decided that unless some way could be found to flank the Japanese defences, a full-scale battalion attack would be required, with tanks and heavy artillery support. That would not only take time, but cost many lives. The left flank movement was clearly not bearing fruit. If anything, the terrain here was worse. Out on the far right flank, the 2nd 24th Battalion was still trying to dislodge the stubborn Japanese from the 2200 feature. Given the strength of the enemy position, a direct attack was deemed to be impossible, and several flanking movements had not compelled them to withdraw. The pioneers were busy building a road which would allow tanks to reach the battalion, but they were still several days from reaching the battle area. Whitehead was considering more drastic options when a patrol of the 2nd 48th Battalion brought welcome news. Despite the nearly impregnable fortifications along the main road itself, to the immediate right of the road, there appeared to be barely any defences at all. A patrol was able to move right around the main Japanese positions to the very edge of the plateau itself, meeting no opposition en route. This seemingly obvious Japanese oversight can be excused by the extremely steep terrain. Here, the thickly wooded mountain slope dropped off at an angle of over 45 degrees. The defenders may well have rationally assumed that an attack from this axis was simply impossible. The patrol, however, noted that a force of several companies, even a battalion, could well move through this area and attack the town of Saddleberg from the right. Attacking by this route would be a dangerous endeavour, however. The men would be badly exposed if the Japanese counterattacked in strength, but Whitehead decided that it was worth the risk. At first light on the 24th of November, Captain Hill's company set out into the wilderness. They marched in silence, carefully clambering over fallen trees and trying not to dislodge loose rocks. They were followed by Captain Broxop's men. As the two companies quietly and carefully moved around the right of the Saddleberg Road, on the left, the 2nd 23rd Battalion executed a large attack on one of the Japanese hilltop positions that had stopped them in their tracks the day before. This diversionary action was not hard-pressed, but the men made sure they made as much noise as possible. With this cover, Hill's company advanced in a torturously slow and careful manner. The whole operation rested upon the eyes and ears of Hill's forward scout, who carefully led the company forward through the dense jungle. By 10.30, they had advanced about 400 metres, and were now in a position to ascend the treacherous spur towards their objective, the imaginatively named Red Roof Hut Spur on the edge of the Saddleberg Plateau, named after the hut with the red roof that stood there. If Hill's men could reach the flat ground at the very top, they would have successfully outflanked the Japanese defences. As Hill began his stealthy climb, battle erupted on the left flank. Along the Saddleberg Road and on the 3200 feature, a probing attack made by the Australians soon evolved into a tough and hot firefight. The Japanese reacted strongly to the 2nd 23rd's diversion with a fierce counterattack. With the sudden assault, the different Australian platoons became dispersed with Japanese elements between them. Neither side welcomed this confusion, but this was simply an outcome of fighting an infantry battle on the top of a jungle-covered mountain. The situation report issued to Brigade at 5pm illustrated just how confused the situation had become. Japanese counterattacked the company which moved after Lin moved out. Then Lin moved in again. Position confused. Titan's on good high ground on Razorback, but has nips in front of him and perhaps behind. Flanks secure. Now the battalion had a force of two companies on the ridgeline with enemy elements between them. Captain Lin's company had suffered 22 casualties during the sharp and confused battle, but as night fell, the battalion's position held firm. As the Japanese were focused on the left, Hill's men quietly moved towards their objective. As they approached the top of the mountain, the slope became so steep that they could not even crawl up 
They had to move single file, one helping the other up over boulders and small cliffs. It was 4.30 in the afternoon when they finally encountered resistance. Just at the very end of the plateau on the spur that led to the Red Roof Hut, a small ridge that projected out from the plateau, the Japanese had in place around 20 fighting positions, small bunkers with overhead cover and weapon slits. This mega force had been deemed adequate by the Japanese commander to guard this whole flank. Such was the nature of the terrain. As soon as they heard movement, the defenders opened up on the approaching Australians, although they could not see them. Hill immediately attacked, but the slope was so steep that he simply could not get close enough to come to grips with the heavily entrenched defenders. The Japanese began rolling grenades down the slope, and Hill was sure that it was so steep that rocks would do almost as good a job. Desperate to break through, the captain ordered one of his best NCOs and platoon commanders, Sergeant Derek, to try and move around the right and flank this position. A 29-year-old farmer from Berry, South Australia, Derek had gained a reputation as a brave and capable soldier. He was already somewhat of a legend within the battalion. Derek immediately led his men across the slope to attack from the north, but his platoon ran into the same steep terrain and stout defences. He reported to Hill that the slopes were so steep that he couldn't get forward or hold the position for more than five minutes. Convinced the whole attack was doomed to failure, Hill signalled to Battalion HQ that he would simply have to withdraw. Brigadier Whitehead immediately ordered Colonel Ainsley to halt the attack and prepare for a combined arms assault up the road in the morning. Receiving this message, Ainsley ordered Hill to withdraw back to his position on the Saddleberg Road. At 6.15pm, Hill moved forward to tell Derek to withdraw. The sergeant was resistant, telling Hill, I think we can get through. We've already done over five posts. The captain was hesitant, explaining his orders, which came directly from Battalion HQ. Undaunted, Derek just told Hill to lie to the colonel. Tell the CO I'm pinned down and can't get out. Just give me another 20 minutes. Hill knew what his sergeant was capable of and decided to give him one more chance. With the captain's backing, Derek resumed the attack. As they had been advancing up the Saddleberg Road over the previous days, the men had enjoyed a good view of the summit, and Derek remembered a clear patch of kunai grass and a pair of bomb craters just below a cliff at the edge of the plateau. Convinced this was the only way forward, he led his men even further to the right. As they advanced, the lead section was pinned by a stubborn Japanese fighting position. Never one to let an obstacle stop him, Derek crawled forward, alone, to within just five metres of the enemy killing them with grenades. He then took command of the second section and led it up the slope towards the crest of the ridge. This force was again halted by an enemy fighting position. In another suicidal act of valour, Derek again scrambled up to the top of the cliff, a position just below the weapon pit, killing these gunners with another grenade. He was so close it was a miracle he wasn't killed. By this time, it was 6.45pm and the platoon was within reach of the summit. The men were again halted by another pair of bunkers, which opened up on them at just 10 metres range. These were both silenced in a similar fashion. As the platoon's gunners poured automatic fire into the weapon slits, one brave man, Derek in one instance, Private Slogger Sutherland in the other, suicidally charged the enemy, throwing grenades through the opening from point-blank range. This broke some of the Japanese, who left their positions and began scrambling up the slope towards Saddleburg. Two were seen leaving a bunker, throwing grenades as they retreated. One of these wounded three men, but Private Washbrook, a 23-year-old farmhand from Swan Hill, Victoria, rose up and advanced on them, firing his Bren from the hip and downing the now exposed enemy in a hailstorm of automatic fire. Clearly, Derek's bravery was rubbing off on the men he led. Some 15 enemy had now been killed since his attack opened. The valour, initiative and fighting spirit of Derek and his small band of men had conquered both the formidable Japanese defences and some of the worst terrain New Guinea had to offer. Saddleberg itself was on a bare plateau at the top of the mountain, with thickly wooded slopes dropping off in all directions, and Derek was now in a position just at the edge of the plateau. As darkness fell, his men were holding a number of Japanese fighting pits on the edge of the open flat ground. The enemy was still to his front and in strength, fighting from a number of small huts. Derek had achieved a miracle, but he was very exposed. There were only 18 Australians at the top of that mountain. A runner soon informed Hill of the situation. The delighted captain both sent word back to battalion and moved up the rest of the company 
Captain Broxop had been keeping his company within an hour's march of Hill across the Seeky Creek and still a little way down the slope. By 8pm, Derek's tiny band had been joined by two full rifle companies. These forces spent the night just 150 metres from Saddleburg, in close proximity to the enemy. Derek's initiative had revolutionised the situation. Within an hour, Whitehead and Ainsley had gone from planning tomorrow's attack to desperately trying to supply the Australians at the top of the mountain. At midnight, the battalion headquarters company set off with water, ammunition and rations. The march was only 500 metres, but the round trip took them eight hours. That's how difficult the terrain was. At first light, Whitehead prepared for the final battle to take Saddleburg. The main defences had been flanked, but they were sure the Japanese would not give up their mountain fortress without another stiff fight. Artillery support was organised, and it took a few hours to register the guns. At 8.25am, with artillery now on call, a section left Hill's position and carefully approached the town of Saddleburg itself. As the men silently walked through the village, they found it completely deserted. As they had several times in this campaign, when outflanked, the Japanese had simply taken advantage of the night and withdrawn. With this lack of resistance, the men rapidly advanced. On the flanks, the Japanese positions that had held up the brigade for days were quickly taken. A company of the 2nd 48th occupied the 3200 feature without encountering opposition. As he walked through Saddleburg, Sergeant Derrick took out an Australian flag he had been carrying throughout the battle. He climbed a nearby tree and, in an impromptu ceremony, the flag was nailed to the top. As the battalion cheered, the Australian flag once again flew over Saddleburg. Undeniably, despite the numerous battles the brigade had fought along the Saddleburg Road, the credit for the final victory and capture of Saddleburg itself should go to Sergeant Derrick. It was only fitting that he was the man to raise the Australian flag. Derrick, and men like him, truly exemplified the fighting spirit, courage and tenacity of the 9th Division writ large, virtues that had been on display since the landing on Scarlet Beach. When facing a situation as challenging as this, many other men would have been all too happy to simply follow orders and withdraw back to the safety and relative comfort of friendly lines. Not Derek. He believed that he could lead his men to victory, despite their tiny number, and through his own valour, that victory was indeed achieved. Sergeant Thomas Derek deservingly received the Victoria Cross for his actions at Saddleburg on the 23rd of November, 1943. Tragically, he would be killed in the last months of the war, falling at Tarakan in May, 1945. The fight to take Saddleburg had been one of the toughest offensives the Australian Army had conducted throughout the entire Second World War. The combination of fearsome terrain, expertly constructed defences, and the practically inexhaustible Japanese fighting spirit conspired to demand everything the 26th Brigade had to give. A battalion diarist recorded the feeling expressed by many of the men that the 10 days of battle along the Saddleburg Road were harder and more nerve-wracking than at any period at El Alamein or Tobruk. The nature of the country combined with the close contact with the enemy to badly test the men's nerves. However, the same diarist remained sceptical that it was as bad as many of the men stated. Yes, the fighting had been tough, but, unlike the Germans, the Japanese almost completely lacked heavy weapons. At Tobruk, the men had to endure a nearly constant artillery bombardment, but here, even Japanese mortar fire was rare. Indeed, much of the success of the 9th Division and the lopsided casualties they inflicted can be attributed to the excellent Australian fire support. Whether it was the battalion's mortars or the division's artillery, virtually any time an Australian unit was in contact, indirect fire was brought to bear on the Japanese. The combination of the infantry patrol and artillery was particularly effective. Japanese elements that were several kilometres from the nearest enemy positions may well have thought themselves relatively safe. But as soon as they were stumbled upon by an Australian patrol, their position would be pounded with 25 pound of fire. This had a significant impact on Japanese morale. Japanese diaries complained bitterly about their serious disadvantage in firepower. As the 26th Brigade moved into the town of Saddleburg, they found a letter, written in English, left for them by the Japanese. It read, We were not successful in our attack against enemy north of Song River due to heavy enemy firepower and subsequently had to withdraw. Our firepower is not strong enough. The Japanese army is really strong, but at present we have no firepower 
and therefore have lost this battle. Just wait and see. Hundreds and thousands of Japanese soldier comrades have died and we will avenge them. We will definitely recapture Finchhafen and Ley. You Australian soldiers have been fooled by Roosevelt. Think it over. New Guinea is a stepping stone to Australia for Japan in the South Seas. It wasn't just a lack of firepower that had crippled the Japanese at Saddleburg, but their logistics. As Hill's men moved through the town, there was abundant evidence that the defenders were critically short of food. They were clearly eating ferns and bamboo hearts. Their dead and wounded were visibly thin, and it was obvious that many had died of sickness. In mid-November, the diarist of the 80th Regiment wrote, Received rice ration for three days. It was like a gift from heaven and everybody rejoiced. At night, heard loud voices of the enemy. They are probably drinking whiskey because they are a rich country and their trucks are able to bring up such desirable things. I certainly envy them. Although they were definitely not drinking whiskey and many Australian soldiers complained about their rations, they were certainly far more adequate. After studying captured documents, Allied intelligence concluded that under favourable circumstances, which rarely occurred, each Japanese soldier in New Guinea was issued a mere 1,140 grams of food per day, composed primarily of 870 grams of rice and just 90 grams of meat. This ration provided less than 1,500 calories per day, certainly not enough for a soldier operating in such hard country. Australian rations were roughly twice as large and included luxuries like chocolate and tea. And, again, that assumed things were going well for the Japanese. At Saddleburg, things were far worse. Though it occurred in a different area of the front, the capture of Pabu had a decisive impact on the Battle of Saddleburg. With the loss of the Wareo track, the Japanese could simply not adequately supply their forces. Even though the defenders of Pabu were under almost constant pressure, besieged as they were in their mountain fortress, they still dominated this critical line of communication. But despite the obvious Australian possession of this feature, which dominated the track with machine gun fire, and the piles of Japanese bodies along the track itself, parties of men continued to use it. Major Mollard, the commanding officer at Pabu, recalled this astonishing Japanese behaviour. During all this fighting, Japanese soldiers kept walking up and down the Bongo Oreo track. They were supply parties, either carrying food and ammunition to Oreo, or returning for a new load. The most astounding thing was their complete lack of protective measures. They walked along the track as though they were strolling in a park back at home, despite the fact that corpses of their comrades were piled up on either side. Our vicar's gunners were almost hysterical with joy as these successive parties kept offering the machine gunners dream target. A line of men, one behind the other, who could be fired on at ranges of less than 400 yards. As ourselves... We were speechless with astonishment and kept thinking that each successive party must be the last. Why the Japanese infantry who were attacking us so relentlessly did not warn their comrades of the danger is something that none of us can answer. The 10-day siege of Pabu was a critical element in the Australian victory. Second 32nd not only dominated the Wareo track, but sat like a medieval castle right in the center of hostile territory. The Japanese attacked daily, hurling themselves against Pabu's defences. But with the burned-out kunai grass now surrounding this little island of jungle, they had to attack through a cleared killing field. This terrain emphasised the Australian advantage in firepower, with wave after wave mowed down by the battalion's automatic weapons. Although infantry units as large as companies could fight their way in and out of Pabu, native carriers and jeeps could not. Mollard was being supplied adequately by air, with boomerangs and Mitchells dropping a reasonably constant supply of ammunition and batteries for their radios. The latter was critical, as one of the few things preventing the battalion from being overrun was the excellent artillery support. The medium bombers would often drop these supplies out in no man's land, requiring a dangerous recovery operation. The low and slow flying boomerangs, however, were often able to drop their payloads right on top of the battalion, amplifying their worth despite their comparatively small capacity. The biggest issue facing the Australians, other than water, was caring for the wounded. Mollard could not get them out, and the aid station at Pabu was under nearly constant artillery and mortar bombardment. But despite these difficulties, the battalion held onto its fortress, a position that was essentially winning the battle all by itself. 
General Adachi himself recalled the significance of the fall of Pabu. The most advantageous position for the launching of a successful counterattack was given up. Also, Pabu provided excellent observation for artillery fire, and after its capture, the position of the Japanese forces was precarious. Even after the failure of the attack on Scarlet Beach, we still retained some hopes of recapturing Finchhafen. But at this point, the idea was abandoned. Indeed, the capture of Saddleburg itself was a decisive turning point in the whole New Guinea campaign. Until its fall, Adachi had been constantly looking to regain the initiative. Even after the defeat of the 31st Division around Salamaua and Ley, the 18th Army still had substantial offensive potential, as was evidenced by the ferocious attack at Finchhafen in October. But Saddleburg was the key to their whole position. Once it was lost, there was no longer any realistic hope of regaining Finchhafen. Much like the experience of the 51st Division, the prolonged exposure of the 20th Division to battle with the Australian Army had broken its combat power. It, like its sister formation, was now merely a shattered remnant capable of little more than static defence. Since the landing on Scarlet Beach on the 22nd of September, the 9th Division had physically counted 1,848 dead Japanese men. Obviously, many more must have been killed, fallen in the deep jungle or thick kunai grass, or blown to pieces by artillery fire. In fact, with Saddleburg now in Allied hands, Adachi realised that the whole Huon Peninsula was probably lost. The main objective of Japanese forces in the area was now simply to prevent the 9th Division from conducting further offensive operations elsewhere. However, local resistance in small pockets continued in order to keep the Australian troops in action and prevent the 9th Division from being free to make an attack on Cape Gloucester and Marcus Point, east of Gasmata, should resistance cease altogether. While delaying action was being fought at Finchhafen, the 17th Division was being moved by land and sea from Rabaul to Cape Gloucester to resist the anticipated attack in that area. Nonetheless, despite the grave degradation of the 20th Division's offensive power, there were still thousands of brave Japanese soldiers along the Warea Ridge, a feature which ran parallel to Saddleburg across the Song River Valley. The 9th Division had been twice attacked by this enemy formation since its landing on Scarlet Beach, and Wooten had a healthy enough respect for the Japanese fighting spirit to ensure that this force was ejected from his flank before he set off along the coast for Seo. The first operational task was breaking through to Pabu, but a strong Japanese position on Pino Hill sat between the two Australian concentrations. This objective was given to Brigadier Porter, whose brigade was operating in this section of front. Porter planned a combined arms attack on this critical Japanese outpost on the 26th. The 2nd 32nd Battalion was currently split in half, with two of its rifle companies holding Pabu and the other two operating back near the Song River. The attack would be spearheaded by the two reserve companies of the 2nd 32nd Battalion, supported by a force of four tanks, evenly split between the two companies. This attack stood a good chance of breaking through the encircling Japanese forces, but the only question was whether they would get there in time. Two hours before the attack on Pino Hill was launched, at first light, the Japanese unleashed the most fearsome assault on Pabu since its capture. Desperate to reopen the Wareo track and extricate its forces from Saddleburg and Wareo, Katagiri's men hurled themselves at the Australian defenders. At dawn, aided by massed mortar fire, two Japanese 75mm artillery pieces began a steady bombardment. Under the cover of this indirect fire, the Japanese attacked Pabu from three directions. These were companies from the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the 79th Regiment, which attacked from the northwest and southwest. This section of the Pabu perimeter was held by Lieutenant Keeley's company. The defences at Pabu were well developed, with deep fighting positions provided with overhead cover, but there were only two depleted companies holding the perimeter. As soon as the Japanese assault began, the entire 2nd 12th Field Regiment, 24 guns strong, ringed Pabu with high explosive. One Japanese company attacking from the east was caught in the open by this devastating and accurate barrage. Reeling from the impact of this debilitating 25 pounder fire, it immediately broke. The southern arm was also badly disrupted by this artillery bombardment, but still the Japanese pressed on. Badly disorganised units continued to attack through the maelstrom, with many small elements reaching the Australian line. Despite their few numbers, the defenders were aided by both their fortifications and their automatic weapons, each of which enjoyed a cleared field of fire. 
The observation post, situated a little higher up the hill in an exposed position, was manned by Private Sabi, a labourer from Carrington, New South Wales. As Sabi watched the hundreds of Japanese infantry advancing across the cleared ground to his front, a 75mm shell detonated in the tree above him. Badly wounded, Sabi held his position, providing vital situation reports to Lieutenant Keeley. The Japanese charged into the teeth of the defences, with many falling to the Bren, Vickers and rifle fire that reached out to meet them, and whole sections decimated by artillery. Despite the murderous fire, the attackers came on. Eventually, several elements made it through the hailstorm of fire, physically reaching the defences. Infiltrating between the Australian foxholes, a party crawled to within five metres of Sabi's position, taking cover from the incessant fire under a ledge. Despite being alone, Sabi killed the whole party with a grenade. He simply dropped it on them from above. That's how close they were to his fighting position. Nonetheless, at several places, the Japanese were actually able to enter the Australian trenches. With shovel and bayonet in hand, the defenders fought desperately for survival, and many men were killed with fist and rifle butt. Finally, after an hour of this desperate and violent battle, the attack broke, and the Japanese withdrew across the clear ground to the cover of the forest. But even after this initial assault was repulsed, Katagiri's men persisted, and for two and a half hours they attacked in waves. Each time the attack was hard-pressed, but each time was beaten back by a deluge of machine gun fire and the power of the division's artillery. Again, the Australian advantage in firepower was beginning to tell. Nonetheless, the pressure was so severe that it became clear the defenders were not relieved soon. They may well be overrun. A few kilometres to the south, help was beginning to materialise. Colonel Scott's assault on Pino Hill was half an hour late, but by this time, the Japanese position had been drenched by some 2,360 25-pounder shells. Throughout the Papua New Guinea campaigns, the Australians, indeed the Allies more generally, had struggled to truly employ combined arms warfare in engagements with the Japanese. All throughout the mountain fighting along the Kokoda Track, in the Blolo Valley, and in the mountains above Salamaua, Australian and American infantry battalions typically fought alone, supported only by their own weapons. These areas were so remote, generally little more than virgin wilderness, that the battle areas were too far removed from these supporting assets. Not even artillery played a major part in most of these engagements, and the idea of employing armour in these battles was a pipe dream at best. Only at Buna were the Allies able to effectively deploy tanks, which were invaluable in dealing with the Japanese fixed defences and fortifications. The Allies may have enjoyed ample air support, but in the southwest Pacific area, where the battlefields were often one jungle-covered mountain in a sea of such features, facilitating effective close air support and air-to-ground integration more generally was a persistent and extremely difficult challenge. Thus, these engagements were won by the firepower, technical skill, and fighting spirit of the infantry alone. But... Finally, at Saddleburg, the Australian army was able to bring all of its capabilities to bear. At both Finchhafen and Saddleburg, artillery had been a critical advantage enjoyed by the 9th Division, and this devastating fire support was essential in ensuring the survival of numerous exposed elements that were, at times, cut off and surrounded. But now, armour, artillery, engineers and infantry were finally effectively being used together. The combined arms team something that would become a foundational feature in both Australian and American doctrine would show itself to be a doctrinal advantage that the infantry-heavy Japanese would struggle to mitigate. Scott's men left their start line at 9am. His two infantry companies, along with a tank troop, left the edge of the jungle and began advancing on their objective. As they moved towards it, with a whole artillery regiment pouring fire onto the Japanese position, Pino Hill stood before them as a boiling mass of shellfire. Along the flanks, the invaluable Papuans moved carefully through the jungle, searching keenly for the defending Japanese. The advance moved at a steady walking pace, and as the barrage lifted, the attacking companies were right at the base of the hill. The combination of over 2,000 25-pounder shells and the approach of Australian tanks and infantry was too much. As the men began clearing the defences, they found them largely abandoned. Only two machine gun positions tried to halt the advance, but these were easily dealt with by the tanks. Within half an hour, 
Pino Hill, the linchpin of the Japanese defenses in the Bonga Warea line, had fallen. At 10.30am, Captain Richmond's company of the 2nd 43rd Battalion was ordered forward to occupy the newly won Australian position, freeing up the rest of the 2nd 32nd Battalion to march to Pabu and relieve their desperate comrades. Despite the successful morning attack, Pino Hill was subjected to accurate and effective Japanese shell fire that, despite its sporadic nature, inflicted a steady stream of casualties. This included the company CO, Captain Lancaster, and a platoon commander who were both wounded. These casualties caused disorganisation and delay, and thus the relief column was only able to depart Pino Hill at 2.15pm. The infantry set off through the tall Kunai grass, a typically sweltering element of New Guinea terrain, low-lying valleys where the breeze refused to provide relief from the relentless tropical heat. They were also vulnerable here. The grass provided some concealment, but no cover. Despite the hardship, the men pressed on. They were supported by a diversionary attack on the left flank. A pair of tanks, supported by some infantry, attacked a Japanese position on the edge of the jungle, taking several machine gun positions. This diversion achieved its desired effect. Finally, at 4pm, Lieutenant Keeley's exhausted company was relieved. The men were grateful to see their comrades, and within the hour, the whole force began the march back towards Pino Hill, escorting six badly wounded men on stretchers and some 19 other casualties. Keeley's men had survived the Japanese onslaught, and their determined, stubborn, and indeed heroic defense had held a most vital position. At 7.30, after the force was met by a number of jeeps, the men finally reached the relative safety of Pino Hill, which was still under intermittent indirect fire. At the same time, the telephone line to Pabu was again cut by Japanese forces. Now it was Lancaster's company's turn to be surrounded. Evidently, the Japanese were still not done with Pabu. On the 27th of November, Wooten's third phase offensive was ready to begin. The 9th Division's first two operational objectives... Finschhafen and Saddleberg had both been taken, and both victories had required tough and bloody battles to achieve. The final Japanese position was Woreo. Sitting across the precipitous Song River Valley from Saddleberg, the mountain village of Woreo was the final position from which the Japanese could effectively menace Wooten's flank. Once it was taken, he could begin the final task of driving on towards Sio and clearing the north coast of the Huon Peninsula. A major track junction, the Woreo area had been the location of the Japanese divisional headquarters and a vital logistical hub. On the 27th, Wooten stood on the top of Saddleberg Height and gazed over the terrain which stood between him and his objective. A maze of deep jungle-clad valleys and towering mountains, only cut by native tracks and footpaths. He viewed the country with General Berryman, the acting corps commander, who conferred with Wooten about his upcoming offensive. Viewing the treacherous terrain, Berryman immediately raised concerns about Wooten's ability to supply his forces in such nightmarish country. The original plan for the third phase offensive included a massed division attack with three brigades advancing over three separate axes. Berryman questioned the wisdom of this operational plan, arguing that the challenge of feeding and supplying his men was likely to cause more trouble to Wooten's plans than the Japanese, and thus the attack should be made by only two brigades. The valiant but exhausted 20th Brigade which had seen the hardest and most prolonged fighting in the Huon Peninsula, should act as a reserve to the coastal thrust. Seeing the wisdom of this advice, Wooten changed his plan of attack accordingly. Across the Song River Valley, the Japanese defensive position was anchored on the Warreo Ridge, a terrain feature that essentially ran from east to west, terminating at the ocean near the towns of Bonga and Gusika. The whole position was supplied by the Warreo Track, which left the coast near Gusika and climbed into the mountains, past the Australian position at Pabu and up to Warreo. The Warreo Ridge itself was separated from the main strength of the 9th Division by the Song River. Despite the fact that everyone knew the 20th Division had now been defeated and would soon be driven back, a sentiment admitted by General Adachi himself, the badly depleted Japanese formation was still capable of putting up ferocious resistance. The Division's frontline units were concentrated in three areas. Facing the Australians along the coastal sector and around Pabu was an ad hoc battle group composed of the 2nd Battalion, 238th Regiment, part of the 2nd Battalion 79th Regiment, and an element of the 26th Field Artillery Regiment. Holding the centre, inland of Pabu, was the remainder of the 79th Regiment. This formation had been badly mauled in the fierce battle with the 24th Brigade around Scarlet Beach, and many of its units had been decimated by combat and disease. 
they would once again face the 24th Brigade in the defence of a coastal sector that had already been broken by the daring Australian attack at Pabu. Inland, around Warao itself, stood the 80th Regiment, primarily its 2nd and 3rd Battalions, that had been heavily engaged around Jaibebenang and in the defence of Saddleberg itself. These two battalions were finally joined by the regiment's 1st Battalion, which had been reformed after its near-complete destruction around Salamaua. The Australian offensive, one that would take them all the way to Sio and Saidor, began along the coast. Despite its relief, the 2nd 32nd Battalion's position at Pabu was still under heavy pressure, especially from a pair of high ground Japanese concentrations to its east and west, codenamed Exchange and Horace's Rump. Major Mollard informed Porter that unless these positions could be neutralised, he was still in severe danger of losing Pabu. The task of advancing in this sector was allotted to the 2nd 28th Battalion, veterans of the Battle of Scarlet Beach. Their orders were to reinforce the 2nd 32nd at Pabu, clear the high ground along the Warao track and drive along the coast to Gusika. Colonel Joshua immediately dispatched one of his rifle companies to reinforce Pabu and its hard-pressed defenders of the 2nd 32nd, a battalion which already had two of its four rifle companies badly depleted by the desperate defence of this position. The rest of Joshua's battalion was then ordered to drive along the coast. The three companies were supported by a troop of tanks, which would attack in column. The coastal country was flat, wet and marshy, hardly ideal tank country. Thus, it was decided that the Matildas would simply move behind the lead company and operate along the track itself, only moving forward once resistance had been encountered. This battalion battle group was supported by an element of engineers, a detachment of the 2nd 7th Field Company, whose bulldozers followed close behind, clearing ground for the jeep track which would sustain the advance. The attack was slow but steady, its pace inhibited more by the terrain than the Japanese. By 2.15pm on the 28th, the lead company engaged a stubborn Japanese rearguard holding a river crossing south of Bonga, but after the tanks were belatedly brought forward, the Japanese withdrew, inflicting more significant delay than casualties. The Matildas had again proved their worth, and it was now abundantly clear how useful they would have been in the Finchhafen operation. As the armour advanced towards Bonga, Captain Kopik's company attacked east from Pabu. They assaulted the Japanese position at Exchange, a mountain fortress that had given the 2nd 32nd so much trouble. Rather than stubborn resistance, Kopik's men were greeted with silence. Exchange had been abandoned, though evidence of its use by Japanese forces was everywhere. With the 2nd 28th now in the area, the exhausted 2nd 32nd Battalion was finally moved into reserve. Despite being under siege for nearly two weeks, the gallant battalion had resolutely held Pabu. During that period, it was under constant artillery fire and subjected to countless Japanese attacks, assaults that only became more desperate as the battle wore on. All four of its rifle companies had served their time defending the Pabu perimeter, and all had suffered dearly for it. Including sick and lightly wounded, most were now at half strength. Despite their costly sacrifice, Pabu had been a battle-winning action. Morning of the 29th found Brigadier Porter in a sunny mood. It was clear that the advance was going well. Although not broken, the tenacious resistance and ferocious Japanese fighting spirit the Australian army had become all too accustomed to was clearly beginning to crack. Buoyed by the light resistance, Porter ordered the 2nd 28th Battalion CO, Colonel Joshua, to widen his advance, attacking simultaneously along the coast and inland towards a feature called the Lakes. By mid-morning, his men took the coastal village of Bonga unopposed. At midday, accompanied by two rifle companies, Joshua himself was standing on Pabu, the once pristine forested jungle mountain, now a shattered battlefield, scarred by craters and festooned with corpses. After 10 long days of continuous battle holding a most precarious position deep behind Japanese lines, the 2nd 32nd Battalion had lost 25 dead and a further 51 seriously wounded. Surrounding, and often in between, their fighting positions, some 195 dead Japanese bodies were scattered all along the perimeter. With them were 10 machine guns and a pair of mortars. Many more hastily dug graves were found in the vicinity, indicating that total Japanese casualties in the Siege of Pabu may have been in excess of 500. Joshua immediately began probing the Japanese positions around Exchange and Pabu. Captain Grant's company attacked towards a hill codenamed Horace's Head just inland of Pabu. Unlike Exchange, the Japanese had decided to defend this position, and within minutes Grant's men were in a serious firefight. 
As the company advanced up the track, they stumbled into well-camouflaged defences. When the enemy opened up on them with heavy and accurate automatic fire, the centre section's commander was killed, pinning the platoon. Now stuck in a desperate situation, the platoon was only saved by the bravery and initiative of Private Bamus, a 29-year-old bogger from Nyabing, Western Australia. His corporal now killed. Bamus, a Bren gunner, took command of the section and led the men forward. Bamus attacked into a hailstorm of fire, with a pair of medium machine guns covering his position in depth. With the section unable to advance into the teeth of such deadly and heavy fire, Bamus decided to press on alone. Creeping forward through the jungle, he reached a good firing position, silencing the first Japanese gun with close-range Bren fire. He then attacked the second machine gun, again alone, killing the gunners with grenades. With the fire now abating, the section pressed on. Bamus received the Distinguished Conduct Medal for his actions near Pabu on the 29th of November 1943. Further to the right, Sergeant Bonner's platoon crawled towards the Japanese defences which were sighted in a patch of bamboo and jungle. Just like Bamus before him, when Bonner's platoon was pinned by heavy Japanese fire, the sergeant advanced alone, silencing two positions with grenades. With these foremost guns destroyed, the platoon was able to reach the Japanese fortifications, jumping into the slit trenches. In a strange incident, as the Australians approached, the Japanese yelled, in English, Come this way, and don't shoot, they are ours. Suffice it to say that this subterfuge, hampered as it was by thick Japanese accents, was unsuccessful, and several Japanese soldiers were killed either in the trenches or as they tried to flee. Despite Bamus and Bonner's heroics, the latter of which received the military medal, the company was again halted by heavy fire. Notwithstanding the value of the ground won by such a skillful and gallant attack, Joshua decided that holding it was probably unwise, given how precarious his forward positions were, and the men were ordered to withdraw back to Pabu. As Porter's men were advancing along the coast, Brigadier Whitehead's 26th Brigade began its move towards Wareo. The first order of business was establishing a bridgehead across the Song River, as this was the main geographical obstacle between Whitehead and Wareo. Several patrols moved out into the valley, and by early afternoon had made contact with Japanese forces. Hoping to take the suspension bridge intact, the main crossing along the Wareo Katika track, the Australians were unhappy to find it destroyed and the crossing heavily defended. But the Japanese, now ordered to delay rather than defeat the Australian advance, could not hold the whole line of the river and within hours, another ford was located upstream. By nightfall, Lieutenant Lin's company of the 2nd 23rd had made a successful crossing and the bridgehead was secure. Wooten's attack was now gaining momentum. With the Japanese clearly beaten and his three veteran AIF brigades all now battle-worn, the general decided to employ the 4th Brigade. A militia formation, the 4th Brigade had been intended to hold vital positions allowing the elite all volunteer AIF brigades, which composed the 9th Division, to take on the bulk of the fighting. But here Wooten decided that the militiamen would be put to better use in attack. Brigadier Edgar, a veteran of the Kokoda track campaign, was ordered to move his brigade to Bonga. Here it would attack along the coast with the objective of securing beach landing areas that would be vital in supplying the advance, which it would then protect. Much like today, the Australian Army of the Second World War was a two-tiered force, with the elite AIF divisions which formed the nation's primary offensive arm, supported by the formations of the citizen military forces, colloquially called the militia. Akin to the US National Guard, the militia formations were partially composed of conscripts, and thus could not, under Australian federal law, be deployed outside of well-defined and highly constrained geographical limitations. Again, probably as it has today, the Australian Army has a generally sceptical attitude towards non-volunteer forces. And throughout 1943, militia formations were only deployed to the front sparingly. When they were, great care was taken to strengthen them with elements from the AIF. Following this trend, Wooten ordered a number of experienced personnel to be attached to the 4th Brigade's formations as advisors. The 20th, 24th and 26th Brigades would each supply to the 29th, 46th, 37th, 52nd and 22nd Battalions respectively, a team consisting of three officers, nine NCOs, and nine privates capable of leading sections. This was in addition to mortar and machine gun elements. Thus, within the three battalions of the 4th Brigade, there was a solid core of AIF men who were in key leadership positions. It's unclear whether this precaution was actually warranted. Despite the reluctance of the Australian Officer Corps to trust CMF formations, their combat record throughout the war was actually a good one, 
The performance of the militia in battles like Milne Bay, Isarava, or Bob Duby illustrated that, at least when fully trained and armed, CMF battalions and brigades were very capable, and this prejudice was probably unwarranted. By the 30th of November, the 9th Division was poised for what Wooten hoped would be a decisive blow. With the inclusion of the 4th Brigade, the General now had formidable forces under his command. 12 infantry battalions, a tank squadron, machine gun battalion, pioneer battalion, commando squadron, two artillery regiments composed of six batteries of 25 pounders, two batteries of 75 mm mountain guns, and four field companies of engineers. Without the fortress of Saddleburg, General Kataguiri's exhausted division now stood little chance of preventing an Australian breakout. Allied strength in the eastern Huon Peninsula had certainly come a long way since Brigadier Windea's three battalions landed on Scarlet Beach a few months before, and now the Australians were finally operating with a decisive force ratio advantage. On the morning of the 1st of December, the 24th Brigade began its attack in the coastal sector in strength. A night attack the previous evening had taken the high ground around Pabu. Japanese resistance had been sharp, but the battle was short. Again, Combined arms tactics were proving to be a critical advantage. Just as the United States military had learned in battles such as Tarawa and Macon, tank infantry teams, along with the close integration of engineers, were critical in dealing with the Japanese defensive complexes that had seemed impregnable early in the war. As soon as the Japanese machine guns opened up, they were immediately engaged by the tanks, allowing the infantry to move up without being suppressed by their fire. As effective as these tactics were in dealing with the Japanese defences, they did slow the advance down. The tanks had been invaluable along the Saddleburg Road, and they were showing their worth again in the Warreo advance. As the companies of the 2nd 43rd advanced from Pabu towards their high ground objectives, they took a Japanese position astride the main track. The men were shocked to see many fallen Japanese wearing Australian uniforms. They were also carrying Australian rations. One was even using a Bren gun. The bemused Australians quickly realised that most of the airdrops on Pabu had actually fallen on Japanese positions, and the logistical state of the 20th Division was now so grave that they eagerly used these enemy supplies. After this curiosity, the battalion pressed on to its main objective, a position called the Lakes, about halfway up the Waraio track from Bonga and Gusika on the coast. Here the Japanese put up stout resistance, but again the tanks proved their worth. The terrain along this section of track was far more open, with jungle punctuated by cleared grassy hills. Dominating one of these openings was a Japanese high ground position which actually deployed some anti-tank weapons. With the infantry taking casualties from heavy and sustained automatic fire, one of the two supporting tanks advanced alone. As it crested the ridge, a very exposed position, a pair of heavy weapons opened up on it, one 37mm anti-tank gun and a 75mm mountain gun. Determined to neutralise the position, the crew advanced but were soon raked with fire. The Matilda absorbed no fewer than 50 direct hits from these weapons, but the tank kept on fighting. None penetrated its armour, but one of its tracks was partially damaged. Unable to silence the weapons, the vehicle eventually withdrew. Although it may well have been obsolete in Europe, the Matilda II was still an excellent infantry tank and its durability and protection was clearly adequate for the level of anti-tank armament the Japanese were able to employ in the Pacific theatre. By the 3rd, the Australians were on the attack all along the front. The relatively fresh 4th Brigade had now been ordered to advance to Fortification Point. Spearheaded by the 22nd Battalion, the militiamen immediately met stubborn resistance in the form of the 2nd Battalion, 238th Regiment, augmented by a company from the 79th Regiment and some engineers. Led by the very able Major Tashiro, this force put up dogged resistance, holding good defensive ground along a large lagoon. The militiamen relied heavily on artillery to support the advance, but the indomitable Japanese fighting spirit made these attacks costly. In two days of fighting, the battalion only made slow progress, and despite achieving a bridgehead across the contested Kaluang Creek, had some 30 casualties to show for it. The attack in the centre around Wareo was equally slow. Here, the terrain, the weather, and disease conspired to disrupt the Australian offensive as much as the Japanese. In the centre, around the lakes, average company strength of the 2nd 43rd Battalion was now 30 men, and it was becoming clear to Brigadier Porter that the battalion could not advance past its current positions. As it stood, it was engaged in a fierce fight with several Japanese companies that were holding good defensive positions covering open ground, 
Both of its supporting tanks had become bogged in the now sodden ground, and the infantry was desperately trying to extricate them. Things had become so challenging that Porter decided to redeploy the badly depleted 2nd 32nd Battalion, which had heroically defended Pabu throughout the siege. The men had expected a real rest after their ordeal, and most were enjoying the beautiful country, swimming, taking baths, and eating good food. But, to their surprise, by the 4th of December, they were headed back to the front. On the far left of the line, Whitehead's 26th Brigade was being held up by the mountainous terrain. After establishing a bridgehead across the Song River, they were held up by several strong Japanese high ground positions around Waraio itself. Here, unlike the coastal sector, the terrain was extremely rugged, with 1,000 metre high, jungle-clad mountains cut by rain-swollen rivers into deep ravines and valleys. The Japanese were heavily entrenched along a ridge which ran from Waraio through Peak Hill and to the village of Kuanko. Although certainly not as formidable as Saddleburg, this was yet another daunting feature. Aided by a thick jungle and steep terrain, the Japanese were able to effectively halt the 2nd 23rd Battalion. Unwilling to simply sit inside their defences, the Japanese vigorously counterattacked the battalion, one that was now in a precarious and exposed position halfway up the mountain. Although the first attack was beaten back with relative ease, the next was so serious that the battalion had to contract its perimeter into a very small space. It was only the fire support of the 2nd 12th Field Regiment that saved the situation. The regiment's 24 howitzers plastered the Japanese with 25 pound of fire, repeatedly breaking their attacks. To the left flank, way out in the jungle, the commandos of the 2nd 4th Commando Squadron, aided by A Company of the Papuan Battalion, patrolled deeply into the rear of the Japanese position. Unaided and unsupported, the commandos and Papuans marched through endless virgin wilderness, finding crossings over the Upper Song and engaging numerous Japanese elements who presumably thought they were in a relatively safe area. Five days into the attack, it was clear that Wooten was making slow progress. Hampered by the terrain and the weather, a tropical downpour which had finally turned against them, the Australians had not achieved a breakthrough anywhere. But, just as they had throughout the campaign, the steady pressure applied upon the Japanese, constantly attacking in multiple directions, was having its desired effect. The attackers may have been tired from the months of constant battle in the Finchhafen area, but the starving Japanese were truly exhausted, and every day brought more battle, more Australian assaults, and the constant hammering by artillery and mortars. In the words of the Australian official history, poorly administered, indifferently led, and badly supplied, the Japanese of the 20th Division had only their courage and determination left to withstand the Australians' relentless pressure towards Oreo. They could delay the inevitable, but not prevent it. By the 5th, more serious fissures were beginning to develop in the stubborn Japanese resistance. In the centre, around the lakes, the battered 2nd 43rd Battalion found the enemy position that had given them so much trouble abandoned. The Japanese fortification, which was composed of extensive trenches covering an anti-tank ditch, was covered in dead men, rifles, some machine guns, and a dump of 81mm mortar ammunition. With this position taken, the attack passed to the 2nd 32nd Battalion. Their objective was a large mountain behind the Warao track called Christmas Hills. If this could be taken, the last line of communication linking Sio and Warao would be under severe threat. As had been the case throughout the Battle of Saddleburg, Possession of these main tracks was critical to the Japanese who, unlike the Australians, could not be supplied by air. After a 500 round bombardment by the 24th Battery, followed by the battalion's 3 inch mortars, the 2nd 32nd advanced. Once more in battle, the battalion's attack was uncharacteristically slow, but by one careful attack after another, they were able to reach a position just below the summit where they bivouacked for the night. With enemy infantry now just 50 metres away from their main defences, the Japanese, true to form, withdrew during the night. After giving so much at Pabu, the battalion's officers were understandably unwilling to commit their men, many of whom were on the brink of physical and mental exhaustion and collapse, to more bold attacks. Japanese positions were, generally speaking, either hammered by artillery or slowly outflanked. The attack was short, only a few hundred metres, but it took 24 hours to complete. The short advance up the ridge towards Warao was equally slow. Hampered by heavy rain, the 2nd 23rd Battalion, aided by elements of the 2nd 24th, 
were still held firm in the face of strong positions defended by determined Japanese elements. It was clear that a direct attack on positions as formidable as this was probably not going to bear fruit. Aided by aerial reconnaissance, which dropped a handwritten note outlining the location of the Japanese positions right on the battalion HQ, a flank attack was decided upon. The Japanese had heavily fortified the village of Quantiku with four entrenched medium machine guns all covered by at least one 81mm mortar. The village sat on top of a ridge, with steep approaches that were all covered by machine gun positions. Elements of the two Australian battalions fought a tough and sustained day-long battle with the Japanese defenders who, anchored by their crew-served weapons, refused to give ground, even after one company had moved behind them. Despite all of their hardships, the Japanese were still gallantly holding their positions, aided as they were by the nature of the terrain. Kwatinku was just 600 metres from Oreo, but despite how tantalisingly close they were, the Australians could not advance. The slow progress was beginning to worry Brigade HQ. In the evening of the 7th of December, the idea of bypassing Oreo was raised, but as Whitehead rightfully noted, supplying Australian forces any further inland than Oreo was simply not possible. In the mountainous jungle of New Guinea, logistics, as much as the Japanese, delineated the limits of Australian operational potential. There was simply no alternative. In the morning, the 2nd 23rd and 2nd 24th battalions would once again assail the Japanese defences in what would, in all likelihood, be a very costly frontal assault. It was hoped that, with the aid of a heavy artillery preparation, one last great effort could bring them to their final prize. At 7.30am, a platoon of Captain McNamara's company advanced towards the Japanese defences of the village, quietly moving through the jungle as they advanced to contact. But, as they walked through the thick undergrowth, the firefight they expected never came. The men eventually reached the Japanese trenches, but only silence greeted them. The 80th Regiment, as they had done several times throughout the battle, had retreated under the cover of darkness. By 9.15, two companies had gained the Wareo Ridge, taking the formidable high ground that had dominated their approach, all without sustaining a single casualty. For the second time in the campaign, a member of the 26th Brigade had raised the Australian flag over a Japanese mountain fortress. Oreo has been captured, was signalled to both Whitehead and Wooten. As the men walked through the wrecked mountain village of Oreo, they found extensive evidence of the Japanese occupation. Between the ammunition dumps, abandoned medical stations, mass graves and camps, abandoned Japanese equipment was strewn across the ruined town, once the site of General Katagiri's headquarters. The retreat, when it had finally been ordered, was clearly a disorderly one. The 20th Division, battered by months of battle with the Australians and now half-starving, had had enough, and General Adachi finally decided to cut his losses. With the capture of Saddleburg, Pabu and Gusika, it was clear to Japanese command that the early fall of Oreo was inevitable. Thus, in early December, Katagiri received orders to withdraw. Extricating his division would not be an easy task, given the constant pressure all along the front. Divisional headquarters and the battered 79th Regiment would retire by inland tracks to Sio, while the 80th Regiment would move northeast to Lacona and then retire to the north along the coast after the withdrawal of the 79th Regiment. It would be the task of the relatively fresh 2nd Battalion, 238th Regiment, under Major Tashiro, to hold the Australian 4th Brigade along the coast until the rest of the division had escaped. It was the start of a retreat that would quickly become a rout, one that would not stop until the 20th Division reached Wewak, nearly 600 kilometres away. Although there would be some sharp battles between Tashiro's men and the Australian 4th and 20th Brigades, these would only delay what would be a remorseless exploitation. Indeed, the Japanese rearguard was smashed in several battles with the 4th Brigade between Gusika and Fortification Point. With his position rapidly collapsing, on the 5th of January, Adachi ordered both the 20th and 51st Divisions to withdraw all the way to Medang, abandoning the Huon Peninsula to the Allies. By the 15th, the twin bases of Sio and Nambariwa had fallen, and thousands more Japanese men had died in the retreat. Here, the Australians found large Japanese supply dumps, material which the Imperial Japanese Navy had expended such valuable resources to move from Rabaul. With the fall of Oreo, Gusika, and the high ground around Pabu, the Australians had finally won the Battle of Saddleburg. Much like the 51st Division around Salamaua, 
The once mighty 20th was now a shell of its former self. Its scattered elements retreating along numerous inland tracks, desperately trying to escape their remorseless pursuers. Katagiri's once mighty formation had been smashed by the firepower, determination, and technical skill of the 9th Division. Throughout the battle, the Japanese and Australian armies had demonstrated two very different approaches to not only jungle warfare, but offensive operations in general. The Japanese had relied heavily on infiltration, using the jungle to bypass forward Australian positions and access the rear of their formations. This had worked well in 1942, but by late 1943, Australian doctrine had evolved. With widely dispersed Australian battalions arranged in depth and deployed for 360 degree defence, even if the Japanese infiltrated these forward positions, there was no vulnerable point to attack. When attacking the beachhead or other vital areas, Japanese forces found these positions to be strongly held by Australian infantry battalions. Then, after the initial attack had failed, heavy Australian patrol activity would compel the Japanese to withdraw from these penetrations, easing the pressure and allowing the defenders to re-establish communications. In defence, these proved to be very successful tactics, completely negating Japanese offensive doctrine. When the roles were reversed and the Australians used infiltration to their advantage, they were far more successful. The Japanese, unlike the Allies, could not rely upon air supply to sustain their most exposed elements. They also lacked the engineering capability to rapidly build new roads. This meant they had to utilize the main tracks as they already existed. This vulnerability is what made the advance to Pabu such a masterstroke. 2nd 32nd Battalion could be completely supplied by air, and fighting patrols could even break through to Pabu and resupply and relieve it from time to time. The Japanese had no such luxury. When they made a penetration deep behind the forward Australian positions, they would typically be compelled to withdraw within days, simply due to a lack of supply. When Pabu fell, the Japanese continued to use the main Woreo track despite the fact that dozens and dozens of men had been gunned down by the Vickers crews covering it. The fact that the Japanese continued to use the main track whilst the Australians were in control of Pabu, a suicidal act of stubbornness, is evidence of just how few options they had. Simply constructing another line of communication was impossible, so they elected to face the firing squad and continue to walk past the waiting Vickers guns. There were also manifest differences in the way the two armies approached a large-scale offensive. The attack of the 79th Regiment on Scarlet Beach had been short, sharp, and ferocious. Lacking armor and meaningful artillery support, the Japanese used maneuver and infiltration to try and mass infantry at critical areas of vulnerability. Then, once this prerequisite had been achieved, they unleashed a fearsome attack on the Australian defenses, hurling themselves at the gun line with nearly suicidal bravery. These assaults were extremely hard-pressed and were all too often stopped within just meters of the defenders' fighting positions. Whilst it lasted, it was a truly formidable assault that placed extreme pressure upon the 9th Division. Indeed, had Katagiri been facing an inferior allied formation, the sheer audacity, momentum, and inertia of the Japanese tsunami may well have carried all before it. But there were costs to such bravery. The Australian defences at Jaibebenang, Katika, and Scarlet Beach were all well sighted and strongly held by highly seasoned volunteers. Furthermore, Australian infantry battalions now brought a fearsome level of firepower to the fight, especially in the form of their automatic weapons, artillery, and mortars. In terms of pure destructive potential, across these engagements, this gave the Australians a decisive advantage. These two factors, the advantage in Australian heavy weapons and the experience and quality of the battalions facing Katagiri's men, conspired to make the attack on Scarlet Beach an extremely bloody affair for the 20th Division. When they caused panic and enemy retreat, these suicidally brave charges were acts of brilliancy. But when the Japanese ran into an enemy who resolutely held their ground and met their bravery with a withering deluge of automatic fire, the result was pure carnage. The Australians, on the other hand, approached the offensive in a fundamentally different manner. Rather than a massed, ferocious attack, the 9th Division preferred to apply steady, relentless pressure on the Japanese defences. One attack followed the other, and if one Japanese held up the advance, rather than hurling themselves at the defenders' machine guns, the Australians immediately looked to the flanks. Just as they had around Salamaua, 
time after time, formidable Japanese hilltop or mountain defenses had to be abandoned because Australian elements had outflanked them, and the persistent patrol activity constantly threatened Japanese communications. At Finschhafen, Saddleberg, and Wareo, the Japanese defenders slowly crumbled under the steady, relentless pressure, which pushed them back from one position to the next. The 9th Division, especially when it was given the transport assets it actually required to operate effectively, meaning the shipping it needed to bring all of its capabilities and assets to bear, relied far more heavily on combined arms warfare than the Japanese. From the outset, the use of artillery and the coordination between the guns and the infantry was a cornerstone of Australian doctrine and essential in the division's success. Once the tanks were finally able to be deployed, the use of armour, something which had been rare throughout the New Guinea and Papuan campaigns to this point, had also been a decisive advantage. To the British, the mighty Matilda may well have been the queen of the desert, but in the Australian army, it was soon becoming the king of the jungle. Despite its advancing age, the Matilda was still a highly resilient and effective vehicle, and the Japanese lacked a widely used weapon that could reliably defeat it. The Japanese reliance upon field fortifications, something they were extremely good at, was very effectively countered by the use of tank infantry tactics. Just as occurred at Buna, when a Japanese bunker complex was encountered, it could be effectively suppressed by the tank, allowing the infantry to move in close for the kill. The Australians also far more effectively integrated and used their engineers, rapidly constructing jeep tracks and allowing the tanks to reach the forward battle area, which was often in the most remote and rugged mountain wilderness. Through the combination of arms and a far more careful approach to the task of offence, the Australians were able to drive the Japanese out of very formidable fortifications while sustaining comparatively few casualties. Firepower, skill, and relentless operational pressure allowed the 9th Division to drive Katagiri from his mountain fortress at remarkably little cost. Throughout the four months of constant campaigning from the 22nd of September 1943 to the 21st of January 1944, when the 5th Division moved to the relief of the 9th and resumed the advance along the coast, a period of operations where the 9th Australian Division had conducted a contested amphibious landing at Scarlet Beach, driven the Japanese from Finchhafen whilst neither enjoying armoured support nor a force ratio advantage, withstood the fearsome counter-offensive of the 20th Division, which occurred at a time when it was outnumbered 3-2, to two, taken Saddleberg, Pabu, Wareo, and finally Sio, its battle casualties were 1,028. Of these, 283 had been killed, including 16 officers, and some 750 wounded, of whom 50 were officers. One man was missing. Despite the very real significance of this sacrifice, for a division that was in such fierce and constant battle against such a determined and capable foe in such difficult country, those losses were light indeed. In contrast, by mid-January, the 20th Division was a mere shell of its former self. At the high point of the campaign, some 12,600 Japanese combat troops were deployed forward of Sio. Of these, 3,099 had been confirmed dead, physically counted by the Australians, and 38 had been captured. Australian intelligence estimated that the dead to wounded ratio was probably 2 to 3, meaning an additional 4,644 wounded. This brings the estimated Japanese casualty total to 7,781, giving the Australians an 8 to 1 exchange ratio, which swells to 11 to 1 when only killed in action are considered. Captured documents and prisoner interrogation seem to bear this intelligence out, as these resources revealed that a force of about 4,300 men, essentially an overstrength regiment, had escaped from Sio and was retreating along the coast towards Medang. Thus, one way or the other, when facing the 9th Division, some 8,000 Japanese men fell in battle. A consequence of the desperate situation Katagiri found himself in, evidently very few Japanese wounded survived. Furthermore, it was disease, rather than combat, that was causing the Australians the heaviest losses. By January, dengue fever was crippling the division. As an example, in the three months from its arrival at Scarlet Beach at the end of September, the 2nd 43rd Battalion had a complete transformation in personnel. 706 men landed and 130 were received as reinforcements. From these 836 men, an astonishing 742 casualties were suffered. But these weren't from battle, 
600 men were evacuated sick, most suffering from dengue fever, of whom only 396 returned by January. The Mosquito, rather than the Japanese, would soon force the withdrawal of the 9th Division. The Finchhafen campaign, including the battles of Saddleburg and Warreo, was in many ways a decisive turning point in the wider Papuan and New Guinea campaign, or indeed the war in the Southwest Pacific as a whole. The first stage had opened with the 1942 Japanese offensive into Papua, one that had been stopped at Milne Bay and Kokoda by the 7th and 11th Australian Divisions. Then, at Boona and Gona, with the aid of the US 32nd Red Arrow Division, the Japanese had been driven from Papua, bringing an end to the Japanese strategic offensive and, thus, the first phase of the wider campaign. The second phase began with the Australian drive into New Guinea. Buoyed by the successful defence of Wau, the Australian 3rd and 5th Divisions, with the aid of the US 41st, drew the Japanese into battle around Salamaua. About a third of the 18th Japanese Army was ground to a pulp in the Salamaua meat grinder, and the remnant of the 51st Division was forced to flee into the rugged interior of the Huon Peninsula by the daring double envelopment of Ley by the 2nd Australian Corps. But throughout the early stages of the Huon Peninsula campaign, the 18th Japanese Army was hardly a beaten force. Adachi still had credible hopes of launching a decisive counter-offensive and regaining the initiative in New Guinea, stopping the Allies in their tracks and preventing the Americans from breaking out and advancing towards the Philippines. He even still aimed at the potential recapture of Ley. These aggressive intentions manifested in the ferocious attack by the 20th Division in October 1943, precipitating the desperate Battle of Scarlet Beach. By splitting the 9th Division, Adachi and Katagiri had nearly succeeded in imposing a devastating defeat on the Allies. One of MacArthur's best divisions was in perilous danger of defeat and destruction, and it was only through the fighting quality of the individual infantry battalions that the Allies averted disaster. But even after the 79th Regiment had been badly mauled by the 24th Brigade around Scarlet Beach, Adachi still had hopes of turning the tide, as can be seen by the 2nd Offensive. But everything rested on Saddleburg. Like a Norman castle standing in the depths of Welsh Snowdonia, Katagiri's mountain fortress allowed the Japanese to dominate the entire Finchhafen area, making any advance along the coast impossible without exposing the Allied left flank. At any time, the Japanese could charge down the hill and threaten the Australian beachhead, making a renewed counter-offensive a perpetual possibility. But when Saddleburg fell into Australian hands, all of those prospects immediately evaporated. The threat to Scarlet Beach had been permanently removed, and with Australian forces cutting Japanese communications at Pabu, the plight of the 80th Regiment in the mountains around Saddleburg and Wareo had quickly become desperate. Now it was Katagiri who faced encirclement and annihilation. From now on, any hopes of Japan regaining the initiative in New Guinea were gone. Two of the three Japanese field divisions in New Guinea had been badly mauled, and elements of the 41st Division had also already been committed to battle. Although many tough and bloody fights would have to be waged with determined rearguards, the 20th Division was no longer capable of putting up coherent resistance. It was on the run, a retreat that was quickly becoming a rout, and it was clear that within weeks, the Australians would not only be in control of Seo, but the whole coast of the Huon Peninsula. Further to the rear, at Saidor, the US 32nd Division was planning to rejoin battle with the 18th Japanese Army. On the 2nd of January, 1944, just three weeks after the fall of Oreo, the 126th Regimental Combat Team landed in the rear of the 20th Division, making any defense of the coastal plain between Seo and Medang impossible. There were now essentially two Allied divisions arrayed against Medang, and Katagiri's men would be lucky to escape the Huon Peninsula and reached the relative safety of Wewak on the north coast. Thus, Saddleburg was the watershed, the moment when the outcome of the New Guinea campaign was no longer in doubt, and Adachi's thoughts and hopes turned from victory to survival. With the capture of Finchhafen, Saddleburg and Seo, and the accompanying destruction of the 20th Division, the long-awaited American breakout was ready to begin. The landing at Saidor would be the first in a series of amphibious operations that would rapidly take MacArthur all the way to the Philippines. With the Vitiage Strait secured, the primary Japanese defensive barrier had been fatally compromised, and there was now nothing between the US 6th Army and MacArthur's real prize, Manila. Operating under Allied air cover and leveraging the growing strength of the US 7th Fleet, MacArthur would begin a dazzling amphibious offensive leapfrogging the Japanese positions along the north coast of New Guinea, 
After Sidor and Cape Gloucester, the 6th Army would simply bypass Adachi's main strength at Wewak. With the capture of the Admiralty Islands in late February, the Japanese 8th Area Army, which was composed of Adachi's 18th Army in New Guinea and Hayakotake's 17th on Bougainville, was now permanently isolated. This would precipitate a rolling series of landings deep behind the Japanese defences, starting at Etape and Hollandia in April and culminating at Sansapur in July. Perhaps the decisive campaign of the Pacific War, undeniably the success of MacArthur's 1944 Western New Guinea and Philippine Offensive, was built upon the foundation of the brutal and grinding Australian victories at Salamaua, Ley, Finchhafen and Saddleberg, without which any such advance would have simply not been possible. But before any of this could begin in earnest, there was still unfinished business in the Ramu Valley. As the 9th Division was exploiting their victory at Saddleburg and driving the 20th Division along the coast, the 7th Australian Division was beginning to enter the mountains. The 7th Division was close to the major Japanese base at Madang, and with the American landing at Saidor, the time had come to try and break out of the Ramu Valley. But between them and their prize stood the awesome 4,000 metre high Finisterre range. Facing them, along the Kankirio Saddle and its precipitous approaches, was the fresh 78th Infantry Regiment, which had not taken part in the fighting around Finchhafen. It was most heavily dug in on a 2,000 metre high Razorback Ridge that was so narrow and steep that, in places, it was only a few feet wide. Named Shaggy Ridge by the men, if the 7th Division was ever going to reach Medang, one of the three major Japanese bases in New Guinea, then this most formidable feature had to be taken. In the battle to take Shaggy Ridge, the 7th Australian Division would face some of the toughest mountain fighting witnessed anywhere in the Second World War. Although strategically defeated, the 18th Japanese Army was certainly not a beaten fighting force, and driving these most determined defenders from terrain as challenging as this would take some of the greatest martial skill, valour and commitment displayed by the Australian Army anywhere in the Second World War. <laughs> 